בשם השם נעשה ונצליח, שיעור תורה, ברוכים הבאים, ברוך השם, we're uh, back on our uh, monthly uh, שיעור. Thank you first of all, everybody, the, for coming uh, from uh, different parts of the country, ברוך השם, from uh, all over Florida, from New York, from Texas, uh, ברוך השם, from different places, אשריכם ואשריך אל כיכם. Uh, tonight's show will be for Ilui Nishmat uh, Gavriel Ben Mazal, Zechar Tzadik Livracha, and uh, also uh, for a Refua Shlema for Rabbanit Levana Bat Sarah, Rabbi Ephraim Ben Shulamit, Rabbanit Sarah Bat Anat. אבי מורי דוד בן אסריה, אמי מורתי דוריס בת ז'ורה. Also for a הצלחה רבה for מרשה בת ג'ולי, איילה בת מרשה, סמל בן מרשה, ספס בן מרשה, אלכסנדר בן מרשה, לואיס בן מרשה. And uh, all of uh, עם ישראל, all of the righteous Noahides. Oh, and also, um, second, also for רפואה שלמה for uh, Rivka Rimona, but Femi Aniki. And also for the big Atzlacha Rabba for Team Be'ezrat Hashem that are doing Mamash Avodat Hashem in uh, extraordinary ways. And a big Atzlacha Rabba for my children in a Torah and a Mitzvot. And for my dear wife, Kadosh Baruch Hu Yivarech Ota Bekol Mikol Kol. Give our refuah shlema to uh, build a, uh, our uh, home to continue being a uh, bait neeman be Israel full of Torah. And uh, my uh, dear children, Bezad Hashem, be big talmidei chachamim Bezad Hashem one day as they continue to learn. Some of the things that uh, I brought here were my ideas of bringing different sources. Some of my ideas, some of the books were my uh, little Ovadia's ideas. He brought the chidush. So I have to bring it also, Bezad Hashem, we'll bring it in the shiur. And some were, Baruch Hashem, little Yosef's idea, and some were little Sarah's idea, and some were the Rabbanit's idea. So, Baruch Hashem, of course, Rav Ephraim uh, is the, the basic foundation of the entire Shiu. Bezot Hashem HaKadosh Baruch Hu will have mercy on us to be able to give you the Shiu the way it's really supposed to be. Uh, because if we truly understand the words of the sages the way that we uh, should, uh, it's a life-changing shiur. Now, as an update, uh, we have, Baruch Hashem, a lot of amazing things happening in the, uh, you know, in the last several months. We had just this, uh, the biggest uh, food distribution in Eretz Yisrael our organization has ever had, and apparently HaKadosh Baruch Hu wanted to uh, increase the merit of all of those that contributed much more than they could ever imagine. Uh, not only because of the size of the contribution, but also because of the need and of how it was made. Where uh, anyone that contributed to the Pesach campaign should be, uh, give themselves a few pats on the back. Uh, because the mitzvah that you made is much bigger than you can imagine. Similar to how when a person looks at a star, they can say, oh, a star is this big. But when a person really gets closer to a star, they realize how big it is. It could be the sun. Now, the mitzvah was big already because the uh, Rambam, Shuchan Aruch, all of the poskim say it's a mitzvah that is an obligation of all of, uh, for all Jews to contribute to help the poor before the holidays, and on a regular basis, but especially before the holidays. So the Kimcha de Pizra is not just a minhag. It's not a custom. It's a mitzvah. It's an obligation. But there are different levels of tzedakah. And uh, to give tzedakah to poor people is a very big level. To give tzedakah to a Talmit Chacham that's poor, it's obviously much greater. But there's even levels in there where uh, a person that gives tzedakah basetir, which means that he doesn't know who he's giving to, and the one that's receiving it doesn't know who he's getting it from. It's the highest level of tzedakah. So much so that the Gemara says that it's even bigger than, he, in that aspect, he's bigger than Moshe Rabbeinu. That's how great that tzedakah is. Now, of course, all of the different distributions that we do, there's always our team that gives to people. People know who we are in, uh, in Eretz Israel, but uh, usually there's something, there's a little logo somewhere, there's an envelope, there is a mention of something. 
But HaKadosh Baruch Hu made sure that the tzedakah that the people give this year, whether it's the organization contributing or it's the people contributing a combination of, is the highest possible level that it could ever be. The highest possible level. Why highest possible level? People don't even realize what they did. A person just contributed a hundred dollars or a thousand dollars or one of the righteous uh, contributors of our organization a uh, person that gives the Kaba Setel on a regular basis gave an extraordinary amount of money why? because it's good to do good they don't even realize how big it was, why? because usually you give, somebody knows the receiver knows, somebody knows HaKadosh Baruch Hu makes sure that this is the biggest it could possibly be number one Many of the people that received told us time and time again that every year there are many organizations that distribute food and money and so on in Eretz Yisrael. Apparently this year many of those organizations were out of business. They simply didn't do it. So many of the people that were used to getting a few dollars from here, a few dollars from there, a few dollars from different places literally had zero, nothing. Meaning that what they got from the organization was everything that they had. Mamas, you saved a life. And we're not talking about just saving a life of a regular person, we're talking about saving a life of Avrechim, Tzadikim. And even more so, as you would have it, we uh, made a deal to, to buy the, the food cards, the, the uh, credit from the uh, biggest supermarket in Eretz Yisrael, so it allows everybody to buy whatever they want, whatever they need, whatever kashrut they want, because there's different kashrut in Eretz Yisrael, very different than America. It's not just uh, uh, one or two different types of kashrut. Over there, there's different levels and different people accept different things. So, usually the card has our name on it, the envelope has a name on it, something. To signify where it got from. This year, Baruch Hashem, HaKadosh Baruch Hu made it so, there's nothing. Meaning the card has the store name on it. The person that received it has no idea where he got it from. Literally, it was man from Shemaim. No envelope with the logo, no logo on the card, nothing, nothing. This gave us the ability to mamash dutz dakaba setel. The giver has no idea what tzaddik got the money that he gave, and the tzaddik that received has no idea who he gave it. Giving a person mamash the highest possible level of mitzvah. Why would HaKadosh Baruch do this? You would say, wait a minute, shouldn't Hashem make it public that people know so the organization grows bigger and more people donate, more people this. Don't worry, HaKadosh Baruch knows what he's doing. He knows what he's doing when he wants to increase a person's sachar, he wants to increase a person's reward. He does different things like this. So Baruch Hashem, that was one thing that happened that was very big. Even more so, we see that our team, the Portuguese team, the Spanish team, the German team, the, the French team, of course the English team, all the different teams, the Russian team, the, the, the uh, amount of people that are watching the shulim is the highest it's ever been. Anyone that uh, watches some of our shulim in different languages, you see that the increase in subscribers and people that are watching and views on the other channels has gone up drastically over the last few months. Literally, you have almost 10,000 subscribers in a Spanish channel, 5,000 or so in a Portuguese channel, all of the, the, the Russian channel, the Hebrew channel. Everything has gone up exponentially. People from all over the world are looking for the truth and Baruch Hashem, they're finding it. And you see the comments and you see that it's real people. It's not some bots. It's a, uh, it's a, you see it's real people, real things, and it's affecting lives. You see what they're writing and how it's impacting them and how extraordinary it is for them. And Baruch Hashem, the, the team is more excited than ever to continue doing more and more. You need me to say, sorry, the, the thing is not working? It's fine. So Baruch Hashem, everything is going great. The only thing that we're still waiting for HaKadosh Baruch Hu to do is to open up a gate for us, to give us a place. To give us a place that we could open and do something like this on a regular basis, not just once a month, to have a minyan, to have a yeshiva, to have a lot of things, but... We're still waiting. We're still waiting for the money to come. It may be in your pockets. I'm not sure. Uh, the, uh, it, we're still waiting for the location itself. We're still like, waiting for HaKadosh Baruch Hu to open up the gate. And Bezat Hashem, it's going to happen very soon. Now, one thing I do know for sure is that everything is calculated. Everything is calculated in Shamaim. Everything has its time. Everything has its place. Everything happens for a specific reason. Everything is calculated. The same token, 
we see that the world today is more confused than it's ever been before. You have people, Rabbi Fahim likes to call them atzitz. Atzitz is like a plant. They say things in the name of the Torah against the Torah. They represent the Torah. Sometimes they're rabbis, sometimes there's some model that uh, pretends he knows Torah or she knows Torah. And they say things in the name of the Torah. They'll even say a rabbi's name. 100% against the Torah. One guy tells me, Rabbi, I'm going to this new shul. This chasidut has saved me. I'm no longer scared of Gehenom. I just love Hashem now. Guaranteed to go to Gehenom with such a mindset. Then you'll be scared of Gehenom. Why? Because the biggest Hasidim in history, Rabbi Nachman Breslev, the Lubavitch Rebbe, the, uh, the Baal Atanya, the Baal Shem Tov, wrote extensively about how the foundation of your connection to HaKadosh Baruch Hu has to start with fear of Hashem, which is fear of punishment. Say you're not scared of gay. No, that means you have a different religion. Another atzitz, another plant, says, if you're scared of Hashem punishing you, it's better you become an atheist. In the name of the Torah, he says this. If you're scared of Hashem punishing you, it's better you become an atheist. What kind of connection to Hashem is that? So when you have people like this speak, it's very easy to know, to, to realize why there's so many people confused. I'm confused about something else. I'm really not confused. I have the answer, but I'm going to pretend I'm confused for your sake. I'm confused about this week's parasha. We have parashat Achrei Mot. In Eretz Yisrael, it's parashat Kedushim. Kedushim. Now, Parashat Achremot, after the death of the two tzaddikim, our own sons, we have a section of the parasha that where most people don't really understand how it's connected to them. Why? Anyone that read the parasha knows this parasha talks about all the arayot, all of the immorality. But not just any immorality, the worst of the worst. Torah tells us, at the end of the parasha, that the Kadosh Baruch Hu is warning Am Yisrael, warning Am Yisrael from specific sins, horrific sins, sins that, for all intents and purposes, seem like taboo. Kadosh Baruch Hu says to Moshe Rabbeinu, Vayidaber Adonai el Moshe leemo, Daber el Bnei Yisrael, Vamar ta'alem, Ani Adonai Eloichem. Kemaase Eretz Mitzrayim, Asher yashavtem ba lo ta'asu, Ukemaase Eretz Knaan, Asher ani mevi etchem, Shama lo ta'asu, Ubechukotem lo telechu. Hashem spoke to Moshe, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, and say to them, I am Hashem, your God. Do not perform the practice of the land of Egypt in which you dwelled, and do not perform the practice of the land of Canaan to which I bring you, and do not follow their traditions. So here we see HaKadosh Baruch Hu giving us a very strong warning not to be like the Egyptians, not to be like the Canaanites. Chachamim say, what is he talking about? He's talking about immorality. The immorality of the Egyptians was something out of this world, only to be competed with the generation of Noah that got destroyed, the generation of Enosh before him, that got destroyed, most of them, a third of the world died even before Parashat Noah, HaKadosh Baruch Hu flooded the world. Most people think that the flood of Noah was the only flood. There were several floods that HaKadosh Baruch Hu did, just not as big as Noah, 
generation of Enosh also had a big destruction. Sodom and Gomorrah destroyed. Egypt destroyed. Chamim say this all has to do with immorality. Where homosexuality not only became standard, but it became kosher. They started advertising it as this is something you can get a ketubah, men and men. Unfortunately, something that's happening today. Adultery, standard. Unfortunately, something that's happening today. All types of filth, standard. HaKadosh Baruch Hu couldn't deal with it. From there, Chachamim say that this is even worse than idolatry. But then the Torah tells us, HaKadosh Baruch Hu doesn't want us to act like these behemoth, these animals, whether it be the Egyptians or the Canaanites, which also has to do with idolatry. But then he starts telling us all these rules. What are these rules? A man should not approach his close relative to uncovered nakedness. I am Hashem. Okay, what kind of relative? Nakedness of a father or your mother or your brother or your sister or your father's wife even if she's not your mom or your daughter or your son. In so many words, incest. Now if I were to give this shoe 40 years ago, most of the crowd would have gone up and left. Why? It wasn't relevant back then. When I was a boy, years ago, to be homosexual was something that most people hid. It existed since the beginning of time. It's something that a Kadosh Baruch Hu calls an abomination, where all of these sins of incest are not called an abomination. Mother with son, father with daughter, brother and sister, not called an abomination. But at the end it says, that you shall not lie, not lie with a man as, as one lies with a woman. It's an abomination. Chachamim say, look, all of the incest, brother, sister, mother, son, all this disgusting stuff, taboo. Kadosh Baruch doesn't say it's, it's not an abomination. It's forbidden. It's death penalty. It's genom. But it's not abomination. Homosexuality, abomination. Bestiality, abomination. Why? That's against nature. A brother being attracted to his sister or a father to his daughter, it's not against nature. To us, it's not normal because we're trying to be normal people or decent people. I should say normal is not really normal anymore. But it's not against nature. You're not defying nature because any metoav, any, any, any of these homosexuals that walks around promoting homosexuality in Disneyland, and on the TV, and in Hollywood, and all this stuff, we could only wish one thing of them. If they don't do tshuva, we wish something else. We wish that their father was also homosexual, because that way they wouldn't come to the world. But then, that would bring us back to the past. The interesting thing is here, the Torah tells us that all of these things are horrific. Not as bad as homosexuality, but yet... We're asking ourselves, how does that have to do with me? Why do I have to read this parasha every year about brother and sister, this disgusting stuff? Further, after Kadosh Baruch Hu lists all of these different sins in this week's parasha, and then he singles out the homosexuality being an abomination, he reminds us again, don't become contaminated through any of these. Meaning now he's putting everything in one package again. 
the abomination and in essence the non-abomination. It's all back in one package. Don't be contaminated by, through any of them. For through all of these, the nations that I expelled from before you became contaminated. All of this filth, this unnatural and natural, forbidden relations, this has been the standard among the nations since the beginning of time. Don't think it's going to stop anytime soon until Mashiach comes. But you have to separate yourself from them. Now any normal person, and again, the definition of normal being decent and according to the Torah, is back to the question of what does this have to do with me if I'm not one of these people? Better yet, when we think of tzaddikim, you think of the Baba Sali, you think of Rabbi Udaftaya, you think of Rabbi Vadia, you think of uh, the, the, the Chazonish, you think of all these tzaddikim that were tzaddikim literally from birth practically. Some of them were Baalei Tshuva, like Rabbi Akiva, Rabban Yochanan be, uh, Ben Zakai, uh, Resh Lakish, these were all Baalei Tshuva. They got to the highest level of, of Kedusha. Some were converts. Shmai Naftalion, uh, uh, you have uh, Rabbi Akiva's family, you have Jen Itro. Some were literally holy from birth. Chazonish was holy from birth. Where, when he was a little boy, they lived in the poorest of conditions. But every, their, their father was the Rav of the, of the community over there, of the uh, of city over there. All of his kids were like Torah, learned Torah, but they already knew that the Chazonish was special. Why? As a little boy, he didn't go play toys with the other kids. His toy was Torah. His mom would tell him to go to sleep. When you tell your kids to go to sleep, why? It's because they're doing something. They're climbing the walls, they're breaking something, they're building something, they're playing with their toys. The Chazonish's mother would have to tell him to go to sleep. Why? Because he wouldn't put down the Gemara. And I'm not talking about Chazonish, 15 years old. 8 years old, 9 years old. Okay, okay, I'm going to go to sleep. Which one more daf? One more daf, I'm going to go to sleep. And then another daf. Oh, one more, one more, one more daf, and I'm going to go to sleep. I'm going to go to sleep. Yeah, but it's already 11 o'clock at night. Okay, one more daf, I'm going to finish in the Gemara, and I'm going to go to sleep. And another daf, and another daf, and another daf, and another daf. Oh, that's it, you have to go to sleep. Okay, okay, fine, fine. Covers himself. He had a little light that he built himself. And he started learning Gemara under the covers until he passed out. That's how glued he was to the Torah. Nine years old. So when you think of tzaddikim, like, wow, these tzaddikim, they must not have a yetzara. They must not have a yetzara. But who's a bigger tzaddik? Who's a bigger chacham? A tzaddik of the last 50 years? Or the tzaddik of 500 years ago? Everyone knows we have generation, deterioration of the generations. You can't compare Chacham from this generation to someone from previous. Whatever Abu Vadya knows. Surely it's not as much as what, let's say, the, uh, you know, the Baal uh, Shulchan was, Rabbi Yosef Karo. Whatever Rabbi Yosef Karo knew, it's nothing in comparison to, let's say, the Rambam. Whatever Rambam knew, it's nothing in comparison to, let's say, uh, Abaye and Rava and whatever they knew is nothing in comparison to Rabbi Akiva and whatever he knew is nothing in comparison to Shmaya Naftalion and whatever Shmaya Naftalion knew is nothing in comparison to David Melech and Moshe Rabbeinu we have Yeridat Adorot of course it's all extraordinary we would only wish to be a speck of dust that they stepped on one time during their life of any of the ones I just mentioned and any of the ones I didn't mention. But nonetheless, when we think of tzaddikim, we're thinking, oh, if this chazonish, already at nine years old, is already glued to the Torah, surely he was kadosh. 
And surely he did not even have a Yetzirah that's like me, that any minute the guy's going to, you know, go with some woman he's not allowed to go with, touch something he's not allowed to touch, look at somewhere he's not allowed to look, be somewhere he's not allowed to be. He probably didn't have this Yetzirah. He probably was already so kadosh that the test that I have with my iPhone and my PC and the BC and the Twitter and the twitching and all this shtuyot, this, this, this ten sons of, of, of Haman that you have there, social media, he probably doesn't have those tests. If that's the case, then I need you to help me with this Gemara. I need you to help me with this Gemara. Whether you read this Gemara or you didn't read this Gemara, you can surely help me with this Gemara. Why? Because the Gemara is very simple. And it says the following. When it comes to the issues of Kedusha, Kedusha, to be holy, we need to understand first of all, what's holiness? Okay, so we, the Torah tells us in Parashat Kedoshim, Kedoshim to you, Ki Kedoshani. You have to be holy because I am holy. Hashem says, what's holiness? It has to do with arayot, has to do with morality, which we're going to get into in a second. Now, the Torah told us in Parashat HaChemot, you have to separate yourself from all of these goyim, that homosexuality is standard for them, adultery is standard for them, promiscuity is standard for them, uh, incest is standard for them, uh, you know, uh, whatever standard of the standard of the world today is standard for them. You have to separate yourself from that. Because that's what Egypt did. That's what uh, Canaan uh, did. That's what America does. That's what Syria does. That's what England does. That's what all the Goim, that's what they do. You have to separate yourself. How? Reminding yourself of the laws every year, of what you're not allowed to do, and it gives you a list of incest. Mother, son, ta, ta, ta. Oh. So you would think, Chazonish, if he's learning Torah at nine years old, surely he does not have this problem of thinking about something inappropriate. So then you have to explain to me this Gemara. The Gemara in Masechet Kiddushin, page 81b, talks about the issues of Yehud. And it says, a man may, may be secluded with his mother or with his daughter, why? They're related to him. He's allowed to be secluded with them because we're not suspecting him of, uh, of uh, doing something inappropriate. But some Chachamim say, no, there should be some uh, monitoring of some kind. Either way, Allah say he's allowed to be secluded. He may be secluded with his sister from time to time. Why from time to time? That already is... Uh, why is he with us so much? Already the Gemara is... Take it easy. Mom, okay, fine. Daughter, fine. But the sister already, you're... Besed. Shmuel says, it's forbidden to be alone with any of the Arayot of the Torah and even with an animal. Forbidden to be with any forbidden woman. Arayot is any, any woman that's forbidden to you. Just so you know, girlfriends are forbidden. Boyfriends are forbidden. There's no such thing as boyfriend-girlfriend in Judaism. There's your wife and there's some strange woman. There's your husband and there's some stranger. That's what there is. There's allowed and there's not allowed. Your wife allowed to you when she's pure. Your husband allowed to you when you're pure. Strange lady, never allowed to you. And there's different levels of strange ladies. There's a strange lady that some people call girlfriend. There's a strange lady that's somebody else's girlfriend, but she's your girlfriend for the day. There's a strange lady that's a Goya. She's not Jewish even. There's a strange lady that she's somebody's wife. That's Eshet Ish. There's all types of strange ladies. There's all types of strange men too. There's a strange man of this week. There's a strange man that pays the rent. There's a strange man that gave you a ride. There's a strange man that, you know, got you new shoes for $600. There's all types of strange men. All of them are forbidden. No one strange is allowed. And there's different levels 
of punishment for it. Rabbi Udaftaya says, when a person is a motzi zera levatala, waste seed, he's already in a big problem. But he's nothing in comparison. His problem is nothing in comparison to the problem that a guy that Mutsi was with a girl. And it's she's his wife. And simply he did what uh, Erve Onan did. Simply he was with his wife, but he doesn't want to bring kids to the world. Why? Because it's going to ruin her figure. He wants it to remain a Barbie doll. Put her on a shelf. Doesn't want to ruin her figure, so he wants to be, he doesn't want to... And him, the second guy, the guy that's married, she's allowed to him. He doesn't want to bring a baby to the world. She doesn't want to bring a baby to the world. They want to enjoy their youth. They want to enjoy their youth. So they don't want to bring the baby to the world. Their problem is nothing in comparison to a couple that uses a condom. But what's the difference? If it's outside, if it's in the condom, what's the difference? Oh, the difference is Rabbi Yudav says. This guy is creating mazikim. This one's creating a whole army. The Satan himself benefits from it. Live different levels of problems. Different levels of problems. Either way, the Gemara here says all of the forbidden people to you, not allowed to be secluded with them, even if it's an animal. Besedr, thank you very much for the Gemara to tell me this. But then the Gemara tells me the personal details of the Chachamim themselves. When somebody thinks of Rabbi Meir, Rabbi Meir Balanes, what do you think of? You think of a Sefer Torah that's alive. The Gemara says Rabbi Meir Balanes was the only scribe that's allowed to write a Sefer Torah without having a Sefer Torah to copy from. Allahically, when you write a Sefer Torah, you have to copy it. You have to, you have to look. This is the letter, this is the letter. This is the letter, this is the letter. You can't just do it from memory. Rabbi Meir Baranes, different halacha for him. Why? This Torah was imprinted in his mind. There is no reality where he doesn't see the Torah. So when you think of somebody like this, this is not relevant to him. Sister, brother, it's gross. It's for regular people that play on the internet. Says Rabbi Meir Baranes to the members of his household, to his own family, be careful to be with me so that I will not be alone with my daughter. What? Rabbi Meir Baranes says, warning, don't leave my daughter alone with me. Now, if he was alone, we'd say it's strange, but he's not alone. Amar Rabbi Tarfon. Rabbi Tarfon says to his members of his family, be careful to be with me so that I will not be alone with my daughter-in-law. My son's wife, don't leave us alone. Don't leave us alone. You ask a person today, listen, you're not allowed to be alone with, uh, with your daughter-in-law. So look at you, what, are you sick? You think I'm going to be with my daughter-in-law? What's wrong with you? What kind of rabbi are you? You guys are sick today. I need a real rabbi. Then explain to me this Gemara. Why is Rabbi Meir Balanis, Kodesh Kodeshim, Sefer Torah alive, telling us, don't leave me alone here with my daughter. Please stay here. Rabbi Tarfon, Kodesh Kodeshim, don't leave me alone. My daughter-in-law is here. Don't, don't, don't leave us alone. No, no, no. It's my daughter-in-law. She's a woman. Don't leave us alone. In fact, the Talmud of Rabbi Tarfon made fun of it. He heard this. He started laughing about it. Ha! Rabbi, come on. Are you kidding me? You're like 80 years old. You, your daughter-in-law. It's not even Shayach. You have Eva Yetzer. You're Kodesh Kodeshim, Rabbi. It's a joke. No, come on. Seriously? What, you think clowns were created today? They always had them. It's old news. So tell me that Rabbi, Rabbi Tafon says, no, come on, Rabbi. They met you serious? Rabbi Tafon looks at him, yeah, I met him serious. What do you mean I'm serious? Don't leave me. You have to stay because I have my, my, my daughter-in-law is here. I have to, can anybody explain to me why Rabbi Tafon, Rabbi Meir Balanes, and the rest of the Chachamim, there's many, many others I'm not mentioning, saying the same exact thing. Don't leave me alone with this one. Don't leave me alone with that one. 
in reality doesn't make any sense. Because we're thinking, even we don't have this problem. And even the Talmud of 2,000 years ago is making fun of it. So it even makes it more difficult to understand why do I have to read this week's parashat Achremot every year about all this incest? It's not relevant to me, theoretically. Before we answer the question, we have to understand what is Kedusha. If you go to some videos out there of the previous generation's rabbis, or you go to the books that were written by real tzaddikim, many from previous generations, you'll understand what Kedusha is, one, two, three. Today it's a little more confusing because people tell you, enjoy life. That's going to make you holy. Be happy. That's going to make you holy. Do mitzvahs. That's going to make you holy. Don't kill anybody. You're on the way to holiness. What about the issues of morality? Yeah, yeah, that too. That too. That too. Don't, don't, don't do anything bad. Don't, you know, don't do anything like what it says. Don't be with your mom and your sister. Eh, well, I really have to teach you that? Well, apparently, Rabbi Meir Baranes and Rabbi Tafon missed the shield. Because they're saying, yeah, you have to remind me every year. So first we have to know what is Kedusha? Parashat Kedushim, next week's parasha in America, it's already this week's parasha in Israel. HaKadosh Baruch Hu says to Moshe, Vayidaber Adonai el Moshe Lemor, Daber el kol aedat bnei Yisrael, Vamar ta'alem Kedushim tiyu ki Kedush ani, Adonai lo echem. Hashem spoke to Moshe saying, speak to the entire assembly of the children of Israel and say to them, you shall be holy, for holy am I, Hashem your God. Chachamim ask, why is a Kadosh Baruch Hu here adding a word? It says, kol edat b'nei Israel, not just daber b'nei Israel, speak to the children of Israel, but rather speak like kol edat to everyone. Midrash Rabbah says, and says the Rambam, the Ramban, Rashi, everybody agrees. Because this Pasuk is relevant to every single person that ever lived before and after the Pasuk. Every child, every adult, every teenager, everybody. The religious, the Baal Tshuva, the convert, everybody. HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, you be holy, because I'm holy. So the Ramban wants to tell us what is holiness. What is his holiness? Why do we even need this holiness? Why is it being spoken to everybody like this? What's so special about it? The Ramban says, first and foremost, know this. This pasuk, if you understand it, then you understand the Torah. If you don't, you have no shayechut whatsoever to the Torah. This pasuk, doshim tiyu ki kadoshani, is the foundation of the entire Torah. Because the vast majority of all of the laws of the Torah depend on this Pasuk. Rashi says, what is Kedoshim? To be removed from forbidden sexual relationships and from any sin of similar immorality. For every place in the Torah 
that you find restriction of sexual immorality, you will find the mention of being holy, of Kedoshim. And the same goes, as a side note, society. Any society, any community, we see that the standard teachings are to be separated from immorality, to be removed from immorality, you will find yourself a holy community. Any community where morality is simply up for grabs, whoever defines it one way is right, everybody's right. One guy thinks he's moral because his boyfriend and him decide to have a son together. They're legally married, him and his boyfriend. So they're moral, according to him. And they're adopting Shmuli from the farm. But they're going to change his name to Shmuel because they want to be moral. Then you have another lady. She's also moral, according to her. It's only her sixth husband in the last five years. She's very moral. She even covers her hair. Very moral. Just so happened that she can't get along with any guy. And she somehow finds guys to marry her very quickly. It's miraculous. The entire world has a shiduch problem, but she finds a husband every year. Amazing. Very moral. Everybody thinks morality is whatever you... Rashi says, morality is something extraordinary. Why? Because morality is, going to, is one of the fundamentals that are required in order to achieve holiness. Any place where there are teachings of morality, especially when it comes to sexuality, where they teach you to separate yourself from promiscuity and from all the garbage of the world, that place will have holiness. Any place where people can wear whatever they want, be whatever they want, do whatever they want, no holiness whatsoever. Simple. If you are finding yourself in a community where the rabbi's wife is wearing no arms, no legs, you have found yourself an immoral place. If you're in a community where the rabbi talks about tikkun abrit, talks about morality, talks about all the things that this parasha talks about, you have found yourself a good community. Simple. And you'll also find that the rabbi that speaks about morality and scares people somehow always tends to have a more modest keila. It's always the coincidence that the one that speaks the truth always happens to have the best tzaddikim. And the one that pretends like he's speaking the truth, but he tells you you can do whatever you want, just don't kill anybody or at least don't get caught, somehow nobody covers their hair or their body or anything else. So Rashi says, this Kedusha has to do with morality. The Ramban, on the other hand, elaborates. Nachmanides says, Kedushim is Prushim. Kedushim is Prushim. Prushim is removed once. Just like Rashi said, removed from forbidden sexual relationships. But not only that, removed from the things that are forbidden and even the things that are permitted to a certain extent. And to read his language exactly, he says the following, Kedoshim is Prushim, even from permitted things because if this only referred to forbidden sexual relations and let's say forbidden foods, then one could rationalize excessive relation with his own wife or just simply have many wives. If you just tell me I'm not allowed to be with the sister, with the mother, with all these animals, whatever it is. Okay, fine. So I'll just be with this one woman and I'll simply be with her nonstop. Or I'll simply get a new wife every month. So Ramban says it cannot mean just forbidden relationships. You also, to be Kadosh, you also have to monitor the things that are permitted too. Because if you don't monitor them, if you don't control them, then you could simply use the Torah in order to be despicable. 
It's called Naval Birshut Torah, despicable in the name of a Torah. Where he says, no, look, it's allowed to be with my wife. Yeah, it's allowed to be with your wife, but nobody says you have to be a rooster 15 times a day all month. Yeah, it's allowed, you're allowed to eat as long as it's kosher, but nobody said eat like your head every day and gain five pounds of meal. It's allowed, but nobody says you have to do it that much. And nobody permitted it. So the Ramban says, Kedusha is not just what Rashi said, but even further. You have to control yourself, even when it comes to the things that are permitted. But for those of you that may take this a little too far, where some people say, oh, so that means that every time I'm with my uh, wife, it's only to make kids. No, not necessarily. There are a couple of mitzvot that have to do with relations with the wife and husband. It's not just to bring kids. If that was the case, they'd simply, everybody would have to get divorced at some point. In fact, the Minchat Yehuda, Rabbi Yehuda Ftaya, Allah shalom, a Talmud uh, Chacham came to him and told me he had a dream that he needs uh, help with. What was his dream? He saw that there was a candle that was a, uh, put a, that he put into some type of uh, uh, pot from uh, um, what was it called a uh, earthenware type of pot. And uh, he saw that the candle is lit, but barely coming out of, you know, you could barely see the light. And then it turned off. And then three times. This is a weird dream. So I wanted the Chacham to tell me. Rabbi Yudav gave him an interpretation. He says, no, no, come on, no, please tell me. Tell me the truth. Rabbi Yudav says to him, I'm only going to tell you the truth if you promise me that you're going to admit that it's true. Because I know you're not going to want to admit. He says, yeah, sure, Chacham, what? He says, the dream means, last night, you woke up three times with a desire to be with your wife. But you figured, nah, and you went back to sleep. He says, Chacham, how'd you know? He says, that's what the dream says. He goes, but how did you get it from the dream? He says, the light is the light of, uh, of, of love. And it didn't go up. It was barely. Why? Because you didn't, uh, you didn't actually do the act. He says, why do I have this dream? You're being rebuked from Shemaim for not fulfilling the mitzvah. You have a mitzvah to be with your wife. Even if you're a chacham, you're in, there's a time and a place for everything. It's not always for kids. So Kedusha is not necessarily only just what people think it is. But it's very, very important to know that even what's allowed has to be under control. The Ramban continues and he says that a person has to be pure and clean and removed from the masses of people who soil themselves with excessive, with excesses of permitted behavior and with unseemly things. So now that we see that there is a definition of Kedusha here, and the Ramban and also Rashi call these Kedushim, they call them, what do they call them? Pushim. Pushim. Ones that separate themselves. We then understand a little bit more about what these Chachamim were talking about. They're not telling you that they're lusting towards the forbidden relationships. Rabbi Meir is not lusting towards his daughter, and uh, Rabbi Tafun is not lusting towards his daughter-in-law. But rather, they're so careful with the law that they don't want to risk anything. Simple. They're what's called pushim. Pushim means that they're even separating themselves from what even would be considered permitted. Why? I can't trust myself even. And what about that Talmud that made fun of him? Says the Gemara, the Talmud that made fun of Rabbi Tarfon. Says Rabbi Abau in the name of Rabbi Hanina. 
only a few days passed before that Talmid fell with his mother-in-law. That Talmid that made fun of Abit Afar, no, come on, no, come on, Rabbi. You're 80 years old, you're afraid to be with your daughter-in-law. Come on, you're joking, right? That Talmid fell with his mother-in-law. Made a sin with his mother-in-law. Why? If you're so righteous, how come you fell? When you make fun of things, it shows what you believe. It shows you believe that this is not relevant to you. This is not relevant to you. The truth is, Rabotai, everything that I just said is relevant to everybody. But people still have to get some more support to understand how it's relevant to them. So we have to go to the Midrash. We have to go to the Midrash to see what the Midrash says, the Midrash Rabbah. The Midrash Rabbah, in Parashat Kedushim, says that in a Siman uh, Kafdalit, 24. Siman, yeah, Siman Kafdalit. Says, the verse of ours says, You shall be holy, for I am holy. For holy am I, Hashem your God. A person may think that this is referring to where God is commanding Am Yisrael to be holy as if they could be holy like Hashem. Meaning that you could be like me. But Torah says, no, no. Doesn't mean that you could be holy like Hashem. That's why it says, holy am I. Meaning that Hashem is telling us, you can be holy. I am holy. You can't be holy like me. No one can be holy like me. But you can do things in order to emulate my behavior. Where do we learn this from? He says we learn this from the Pasuk that Paro talks to Yosef at Tzadik. Where Paro says, Vayomer Paro al Yosef, Ani Paro. Paro says to Yosef, I am Paro. Meaning that you would think that uh, Paro is telling Yosef that you're going to be supreme authority like me, but the Torah says no. He says, I am Paro, meaning that my greatness is above your greatness. That you'll have, you know, authority, but up to a point. So Hashem says, you can be holy, but up to a point. Meaning, you can never be like me. So, here we see that holiness is obviously something that Kadosh Baruch Hu wants from us. But the same token, He's telling us we could be holy like Him. How can we be holy like Him if holiness is only referring to morality? Forbidden relations. Even permitting or not permitting certain things to a limit even if they're permissible. Like how is this relevant to Hashem? Bichlal? Morality is not relevant to Hashem. Even more so, as far as eating or not eating, what's allowed, what's not allowed, limitations, that's not relevant to Hashem. So comes Rabbi Shimon Shkop, one of the G'dolei Ado before the Holocaust. In his Sefer, I don't know if they have this in English, but it's an extraordinary Sefer in Besiat Dishmaya. You can get a copy of this particular part in English, but uh, I don't know if the entire Sefer is in English. Uh, in his uh, Sefer, Share Yoshel, Share Yoshel. In his uh, Akdama, in his, uh, I guess, the introduction, for the sake of time, I'm just going to mention the English parts. Rabbi Shimon Shkop, he was one of the Gedolei Ado right before the Holocaust, and he says the following. Where the Midrash says that to be holy, you have to be removed. Removed from unnecessary indulgence and physical pleasures, as the Ramban, Ramban famously says. Now, it might be thought that God is commanding Am Yisrael that you should be holy like me. And therefore, the Torah says that my holiness is above your holiness. Now, this line of reasoning implies that holiness is a trait that we share with God, all by on a smaller scale. But if holiness begins and ends with abstinence, how can we ascribe that quality to our Creator, who has no base desire, from which to abstain. Everything we just said until this point. 
So the sages teach us that this is not to equate abstinence with holiness, but merely to say that abstinence is a practical expression of this trait, where the essence of holiness is selflessness. Meaning that a person is not just abstaining from a certain act, but rather turning all of his actions into things that have to do with benefiting others. Even if it's his own, it's his own pleasures. Now Rabbi Nachman Breslev, Allah wa Shalom, also discussed this. And the Likutei Ma'aran Tanina, he says that there are many heretical books that have been disseminated in the world that will prevent people from approaching God, such as, let's say, the book of Yerovam ben Nevat, who told Am Yisrael he gave them two golden calves. Rabbi Nachman Breslov says this sounds like shtuyot, sounds like ridiculous, like why would anybody follow this? Obviously, he, he puts up together some books that had a lot of wisdom in them, that were very believable, and people fell because of them. Meaning that, don't think that just because they, somebody else fell for something that you don't even see being relevant to you, it's not really relevant to you. Further, when it comes to the issues like what we're talking about here as far as Kedusha and being holy, says each individual must guard his personal Mashiachness. Where according to each individual's sanctity and purity, so does one possess an aspect of Mashiachness. And one must take care not to damage one's personal Mashiachness. What is this Mashiachness? Don't start thinking that everyone here is Mashiach. I have at least three or four people telling me they're Mashiach a, a day. Rabbi Nachman Breslov says, everyone has a little spark of Mashiach in them. Everyone has something. But that spark is dependent on holiness, on Kedusha. And he says you could ruin that spark, that holy spark, that extraordinary spark, just like that. How can you ruin it? You need it in order to elevate yourself to the highest level, to serve Hashem, to do everything good, to be happy, to be successful, to, to get to heaven. You need this thing. But you could ruin it in one second. How? He says this, damaging this one's Mashiachness, is done by... Sexual immorality. But what kind of sexual immorality? Is it the one that we're talking about? The incest, the brother, the sister, the mother, the, all the stuff that's not relevant to us? Says Rabbi Nachman Beslov, no, doesn't have to go that far. Not even close to that, even. What is it? This is because the Mashiach is represented by the nostrils. As it says in the, uh, uh, the book of Lamentations, Echa, that the spirit of our nostrils, the Mashiach of God, uh, Lamentations 4.20 And sexual immorality is connected with the nostrils. As it says in the uh, uh, Ten Commandments, in the, uh, Exodus chapter 20, verse 13, one of the commandments is what? Lotin af. Lotin af typically is uh, 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 translated as don't be an adulterer. But Rabbi Nachman Breslov brings the same midrash we just brought. He says, no, no. It's not just uh, don't be an adulterer. Like you think be an adulterer by being with somebody's wife, like the Torah is talking about, don't do. No, no. Lotin af also means don't give pleasure to your nose, your af. Smelling another woman, she passed by you. Some woman that's not, not your wife, she passed by you, she has 18 pounds of perfume on her. You enjoy that? In Shemaim, they're calling you an adulterer. You decided to leave your house with 30 pounds of perfume because you want Steve and Jose and Shlomo and David to smell you while you walk down the aisles in the supermarket? You are Mahtiya Rabim. You cause people to sin. Why? 
they smell you, they enjoy it, they think thoughts, you are an adulterer. And you have ruined the spark of Mashiach that's within you. So here we're seeing that the extremes that are mentioned in the Torah of incest and so on, that's the worst case scenario. The damage begins even by something that most people don't even think is a problem. To smell some lady? How is it my fault? To put on perfume because I want to smell good? How is that my fault? That's what HaKadosh Baruch is trying to tell us. If you want to be holy, you have to start taking those things into consideration. Meaning, yes, you are allowed. You are allowed to smell good. But who says you have to smell so good they could smell you three blocks away and for three days after you left? One time we had somebody at my house. We had somebody at my house. For three or four days, the house smelled like them. My wife and I were going crazy because we didn't like the smell. Now surely this person loved the smell. I mean, but this smell, literally my house, we were thinking about burning it. Because it wouldn't go away. Sometimes people, they say, listen, what? I'm allowed to put perfume. You're allowed to put perfume. Nobody says don't put perfume. Don't put, nobody says don't. But do you have to put the whole bottle? Do you have to put the whole bottle? You're allowed to buy a car. But do you have to buy a car that makes everybody's eyes come out? The one with the doors that go up, they go down, it flies in the air. It, it has to be that one. You're allowed to have a nice house, but does it have to have such loud noise and music and the whole neighborhood needs to know that you're having an event? Everybody needs to know. You're allowed to have nice things. And in fact, the Torah tells us a person that is not going to enjoy the food of this world will be judged for it. Now the pshat is, Hashem gave you things to enjoy. Why aren't you enjoying them? But the chidush I had is that the Chachamim tell us that every single thing that you have in this world in order to elevate yourself, in order to be Kadosh, you have to learn how to use everything in order to sanctify Hashem's name. So much so that when you say a bracha on something, you have to already start thinking, not only thank you HaKadosh Baruch Hu for I'm hungry and feeding me. But a person can get to a point where it says, thank you Hashem, not only I'm hungry. Thank you Hashem for making this taste different than every apple I ever ate. Thank you Hashem for making this just the right texture that I like. Thank you Hashem for giving me an apple instead of an orange, because really I like apples more. Thank you, Hashem, for giving me an apple that even looks good, so it already makes me desire the apple before I ate it. Thank you, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, for giving me an opportunity to sanctify your name by eating an apple and benefiting myself. I can say here, I can say, Baruch Hashem. Thank you, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, for allowing me the opportunity to fix the neshama that could possibly be inside this apple. Because a person that does not do brachot on a, on a fruit, HaKadosh Baruch Hu makes sure that this person does not get neshamot in his apples. Unless those, those neshamot deserve a punishment. Why? Because certain people do make certain sins. They have to reincarnate. They have to come back as an apple, as a fruit, as a this, as a that. They have to come back as different things. Rabbi Udaftaya, in his Ruchot Mesaprot, says, one time it was a tzaddik. They used to fast from week to week. And he had this unusual dream. And he sent a messenger to Rabbi Udaftaya. asked him, what is this dream? He says, it's because the tzaddik is fasting. And in Shemaim, they're saying, stop fasting. Why stop fasting? Fasting is just trying to elevate yourselves. No, no, they don't want your fast Why? Because you're a tzaddik. And because you're a tzaddik, every time you would eat, you would fix the neshamot that are inside the food. 
and you would elevate them. And because you're not eating, those neshamot are staying in this world. So in Shemayim, they enough with the fasting. We want you to help us. We want you to help us. So when a person thinks of things like this, wait a minute. There could be a neshama of some person that used to be in this world with a wife and kids and, and, and had a whole life and he made a few mistakes and he had to turn back as, a, as an apple. You know why you turn back as an apple? You know why you turn back as, an, as, as a reincarnate as a banana? You know why you reincarnate as a uh, steak? Anybody know why? Because you forgot to make the blessing. You forgot to make the blessing. Oh, I forgot to make a blessing. But you ate the whole thing. How did you forget the whole time? You forgot you took the first bite because you, the apple or the steak or whatever it is looks so juicy and delicious. You forgot to make the blessing. Okay, the first bite. But it took you 15 minutes to eat it. How did you forget the whole time? You didn't forget. It's not that you didn't forget. You didn't even think. It's you didn't forget Hashem. You didn't even think of Hashem. When a person thinks of HaKadosh Baruch Hu and he wants to elevate his Neshama, he says, Thank you, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, for giving me an opportunity not only to have an apple that's delicious, that's beautiful, that's the right texture, that gives me the opportunity to sanctify your name, but also an opportunity to help somebody else that I don't even know, to do chesed for somebody else. Says Rabbi Shimon Skop, if you want to elevate yourself to the level of Kedusha, it's not just about controlling the way you are when it comes to morality, but even using morality, using sensuality, using the things that are between him and her, using your private moment, using your, your best moments, your most luxurious moments, your most enjoyable moments, every one of the things in your life, using it not just for yourself. Meaning, don't just think you're alone in the world. Once you start operating in such a fashion where there is no more I want to do. There is what needs to be done to benefit this one, to benefit that one, to benefit them. Sometimes taking a break. Benefits them. Why? Somebody teaches, somebody does a lot of good for the public. If he keeps going, 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 doesn't take a break, he could lose steam. He could uh, get, get uh, you know, get sick. He could uh, lose everything because he's not taking a rest. So sometimes a person needs to take a vacation for the sake of the public. Rabbi Shimon Shkop says, that's being kadosh. Meaning that even his vacation is for the sake of the public because he wants to recuperate so he can do even more good for the public that makes that vacation of him holy whereas the next guy next to him that's just going on vacation just because he feels like having a good time he feels like eating a steak because just because it's he just feels like eating a steak he just needs to burn some time between the airport uh, flights he feels like doing stuff that's enjoyable just because he feels like it that's not holy that's animalistic so when it comes down to being holy, the Gemara tells us it's not just about removing yourself from the obvious, but also beginning with the less obvious. Why? If you begin with the less obvious, you're careful where you go because you know that there are certain smells there. You know that there are certain clothes there. You know that there are certain things you're not allowed to see or be next to. If you think about that ahead of time, you're never going to get to the big problem. If you think about, wait a minute, should I really walk around like this? I like to look like this because I get the attention of everybody. When I walk around like this, even though the rabbi says it's immodest, I like the attention. On the other hand, would I like to be the wife of the guy that's looking at me? Not so much. Would I like to be the wife of the guy that's looking at me later tonight when they're alone and he's still thinking of me? Not so much. When a person starts thinking about other people 
all of a sudden, it's not just about doing kindness for other people and being some big tzaddik or tzaddika. All of a sudden, the mitzvot make more sense. Modesty for women is like akidat itzchak. It's like the most difficult thing in the world. Why? Because everybody thinks about, wait a minute, why is it my fault that he can't stop looking at me? I like to wear nothing. I want to be like Chava in Gan Eden. Why is it my problem he's looking? It's not your problem if you think that you're the only one in the world. But if you start thinking about that there are other wives out there and they also have a husband and that husband is going to look at you and that image of you is not going to go away. So when he's with her, he's going to think of you. Now you may think, oh, that's pretty cool. Sure. How about if the opposite happened? Where your husband looked at her and when he was with you, he thought of her. How do you like those apples? Not so tasty. Not so delicious. You have to think about the other way, not just you. All of a sudden, the six feet long wig is not so enticing. Why? Because, yeah, yeah I like that it looks good on me, but... If she was wearing it, I wouldn't like it because my husband would like it. I wouldn't like it on her because he would like it. So maybe I should be more modest, not necessarily because I like the clothes that are more modest, not necessarily because I want to be this holy person, but rather because I wouldn't want it to be done to me, what I'm doing to others that I'm causing all of these men to think of me, it gives me pleasure, but to their wives, it breaks their marriage. Do you know how many divorces happen because of immodesty? Do you know that all of this immodesty eventually leads to some form of immorality? And the Bateddin simply cannot handle the amount of divorces that are coming in. They have to tell people, come back next month, come back in two months, come back in six months, in hopes they don't come back, in hopes that by then, in hopes that by then they work themselves out, or they go to somewhere else. Why does everybody all of a sudden want to get divorced? Our grandparents would not even allow us to say the word divorce in the house. Today, standard, second, third, fourth marriage. Why? Because when we become so selfish that our own desires become priority over everything, all of the holiness of the nation disappears and we become like the goyim, just like that. It's not that the goyim were looking to go be with the mother and the father and the sister and the dog and the cat. No, it's simply everyone lives a life where do you? You only live once mentality. You only live once mentality is whatever is good for you, do it. So one day it's good for him to go find a girlfriend. Another day, another girlfriend. Before you know it, maybe even a boyfriend or two. Before you know it, one of the boyfriends or the girlfriends, they're also going to have somebody else that they're married to. Yeah, but they're married to somebody else. Yeah, but I just, listen, I'm not getting in the way of their marriage. I'm just doing me. I'm just doing me. I'm just enjoying myself. Yeah, but you do realize you're ruining a marriage with the, you doing you. Your pleasure is destroying a life. Listen, I'm not here to destroy, I'm just having a good time. She's a big girl, she can decide for herself. That's the mentality of the adulterer. I'm not telling her what to do, I'm just enjoying myself. The Goyim were not looking to go and commit all of these horrific crimes against the Shem. It's simply a mentality of just enjoy yourself with no boundaries. And this Rabotai, Besiyat Dishmaya was the chidush that I had about Kedusha in general. Because HaKadosh Baruch Hu tells us that this holiness is what separates us from the Goyim. 
But which goyim is he mentioning? He's mentioning the past Egyptians. He's mentioning Canaan. Now the Gemara in Masechet Megillah says that everything that's in the Torah surely is relevant to every generation. Has anybody seen a Canaanite anytime recently in the news? So surely we're not talking about the Canaanites. Surely we're talking about the goyim in general. So who are we talking about? Who has had the most amount of impact on the Jewish people over the last couple of thousand years? Surely you have some of the Middle Eastern effect to a certain extent, but the biggest damage that's caused to Am Yisrael has come from the church. It's come from the church. But how could all of this be blamed on the church? Simple. Ultimately, the matters of Kedusha is the ultimate war between Judaism and the New Testament. And the reason why I say New Testament rather than saying Christianity is because Christianity has many faces. Catholicism, Messianic, uh, all types of uh, uh, fake names. So simple, anyone that believes in the New Testament, that's the umbrella. This issues of Kedusha versus the impurity, the immorality, is the ultimate war between Judaism and the New Testament. How so? The Torah says to be holy because I am holy. Rashi, Ramban say what is holy? Pushim. Be separated from them. Be parush. Who are the Pushim? Rabbi Meir Baranes, Rabbi Tarfon, that were so parush, that were so separated that they were even careful of being with their own daughter and daughter-in-law. Why? They were careful of even things that would be allowed. They were careful. These tzaddikim were careful of even things that were allowed. And who hated the Pushim more than Jesus? That the New Testament says the Pushim. What's Pushim in English? Pharisees. The biggest enemy of the church were the Pushim. The biggest enemy of the church were the Kedoshim. The biggest enemy of the church were the greatest people that ever lived. But why are they the biggest enemy? Why does the church hate the Tzaddikim as much as they do until this day? Teaching, oh, the Pharisees, they were fakers, they wore glamorous clothes. That's what makes them fake. Because they wore glamorous clothes. This war between Judaism and the New Testament is the ultimate war. Why? Because the Torah tells us Kedoshim is Prushim and Prushim is the Pharisees that fight against Jesus Imach Shemo, who said that this Jesus says that you can be the most holy while still being immoral. So long as you believe in Him. Holiness is decided by your belief in Him. Not by your actions. You could be an adulterer and still holy according to the church. You could be a pedophile and still holy according to the church. You could be a murderer and still holy according to the church. Matthew Kelly, the missionary that went to the Boca Raton synagogue or tried to go there. A few years ago wrote in his book, I Know Jesus. That Hitler, Osama bin Laden, and all of the haters of Torah and Am Yisrael, pray for them. They're going to heaven. Why? They believe the, uh, Hitler believed in Jesus. So he's going to heaven. He's not going to get home. Meaning that you can kill six million Jews and still be holy according to Christianity. Because holiness is, has nothing to do with morality. Holiness has to do with idolatry. So now you have, on one end, you have Christianity telling you that you can be holy simply by believing in Yeshu Imachimo. While the Torah says the exact opposite. And Yeshu criticized the holy sages, the Pushim, 
for wearing ostentatious clothing and for being called rabbi because he believed that you need to show that you're poor, a poor exterior. The reality is that his religion promotes abominable interior while our sages use the glamorous clothing, the glamorous exterior, not because they were looking for attention, they were looking to show that they are better, they were looking and as far as they're richer or anything else, but rather the exterior signified, signified the interior. The glamorous clothing of the Pushim was in order to glorify a Kadosh Baruch Hu's name by letting people know we wear this clothes because we are the Pushim. We are the ones that sanctify ourselves by even forbidding ourselves from being next to things that we're allowed to be next to. It's not fancy clothes in order for the sake of fanciness. It's like a uniform. It's a uniform. A uniform of someone that makes sure to control his behavior to such an extent that he's not concerned with the standard of morality, of don't do, commit incest and, and homosexuality and so on. No, even more concerned. Concerned that even the things that are permissible to me are under control. So much so that everything that's permissible to me is only done if it benefits you too. Meaning, if it's permissible to me, doesn't mean I do it. I do it if it's going to benefit you also. I go there if you're going to benefit by me going there. I eat if you're going to benefit if I'm going to eat. I work if you're going to benefit because I work. Meaning that even the things that are allowed to me, the things that are joyful to me, they're not done just because I want to do it. Or just because I'm allowed to do it. The Pushim were so holy that they would only do it if it benefited the public. The exact opposite of Christianity. Where it's all about a single person. Whether that single person is Imach Shimo that's still rotten in getting home and will never come out, or somebody themselves thinking, I'm just here to enjoy myself. Yeah, but you just committed adultery. Listen, you can call whatever you want adultery, not adultery. I had a good time, she had a good time. Why is it my problem? She's married. Yeah, but you just destroyed a marriage. I didn't do anything, I just had a good time. Oh, you're justifying it, just like you're God. And this, Rabotai, is exactly what Jesus got caught for. When he told his rabbi, Yeshua ben Parachia, that the hostess was not so pretty, thinking that the rabbi is even looking at this lady. Why? Because for him, everything is allowed as long as you're having a good time. As long as you're having a good time. But the Pushim Rabotaya Karim, these sages showed a glory, and uh, anything that they did was in order to glorify Kadosh Baruch's name. That's why they were called Pushim. And this is hated by Christianity more than anything else. Why? Because Shlomo HaMelech says in Proverbs, chapter 13, verse 19. He puts everything in perspective. Where he says, nefesh ksilim surmira. Says lust, broken or overcome, is sweet to the soul. But turning from evil, meaning to do tshuva, is an, abom is an abomination to fools. Rashi says, fools like Yeshu detest the very idea that they should ever give up their wickedness. The ones that hate tshuva the most, 
the ones that hate holiness the most are the people that are the most wicked because they don't even know why should I do tshuva why should I be modest I like to look like this where everybody looks at me why should I be generous I worked for the money why should I share why should I do this and why should I do that meaning if it doesn't benefit me directly why should I do it the ultimate selfishness which is the exact opposite of what Kadosh is as Rabbi Shimon Skop says Kadoshim that's selflessness that's being selfless that means that you've gotten to the point where your actions are determined not just by the simple allowed not allowed but rather by is this going to benefit the public or not now when a person thinks of things in this fashion everything becomes different because once a person conquers their own lust to fulfill their own lust they have a lust to fulfill their own lust they have a desire to fulfill their own desires once a person realizes it's not just about fulfilling your desires it's not just about feeding yourself whatever you want to feed yourself being wherever you want to be but rather thinking of things to through all of a sudden that spark of Mashiach that Rabbi Nachman Breslev mentioned starts sparkling why because your actions are no longer determined by the same things that motivate an animal what motivates an animal is instincts the lion wants to mate whoever's in front of him the lion wants to eat whatever's in front of him yummy he doesn't say oh that's salty that's uh, in front of him looks delicious a person that operates their life in such a fashion is no different than an animal hence the reason why immorality is called gilui arayot arayot comes from arye lion immorality is acting like animals now we still have to ask ourselves why is it that we have to read the issues of incest every single year multiple times in the Torah because when I was a little boy the subject of homosexuality was not a common one although it existed people that were homosexual generally speaking kept it in the closet and when they finally came out it was a big thing oh he came out of the closet should have died in the closet but okay he came out of the closet it was better off to die in the closet why because at least they'll have a chance in going to heaven once he came out of the closet Shemish Mo, he's going to regret he's going to want to burn that closet but in those days it was not so common even though it existed since the beginning of time it wasn't acceptable by society it was still taboo <coughs> fast forward 40 years look at what's happened most of you are young so to you you've grew up in such a society where homosexuality not only has become standard but in fact if you don't teach your kids that they should be homosexual you're crazy why that's what Disney is doing that's what the lefty liberals are doing they're telling you that you calling your son your son is against is against the normal uh, behavior that you should have as a parent it's not loving your son how can you decide that your son is your son how can you decide that your daughter wants to be a daughter who made you God and made you decide that he is a boy well God decided that he's a boy because he has the male member no that's not a decision what's a woman we don't know we don't know people in Congress 
people that are executives of corporate America were asked, what is a woman? They don't have an answer. They don't have an answer. They don't know what a woman is. Why? Because if I define woman like the woman has been defined since the beginning of time, I'm no longer normal. I'm no longer accepting of other people's lusts and desires that are out of control. I'm no longer standardizing what used to be taboo just a few decades ago. So you see, Rabotai, we didn't talk about it so much when we were kids. And quietly the Satan made what was once taboo, the standard. The Holy Torah is not telling us that incest is relevant to some people in society. The Holy Torah is telling us that incest is relevant to us in our society. Because the Or Chaim Kadosh says, in Egypt, we got to such a level of impurity, we were at the 49th level of impurity. One more sin, we would have never left Egypt. Hence the reason why Kadosh Bukhu had to get us out of there at once. Hence the reason why the last couple of uh, years were the worst of the worst, because the decree originally was for 400 years. But at 210 years, we got to such a level of impurity that Hashem says that if one of them commits adultery, if one of them commits homosexuality, if one of them commits any bestiality, which is standard among the Egyptians, if one of them does it, that's the 50th level, they will not have a right to exist, they can never leave Egypt. The only thing that kept us out of the 50th level is that we were still moral. We didn't commit adultery, we didn't commit homosexuality like the Egyptians. There were no lesbian Jews, no such thing. Yet we still got to the 49th level. What saved us was the morality we still had. Had one Jew committed homosexual act, one adulteress, one cheating, one, we would have never left as a nation. The Ora Chaim Kadosh says, before Mashiach comes, we will be at the 50th level. And the only reason we can survive the 50th level is because now we have the Torah. That 50th level, Rabotai, is something we're fast approaching every year. 40 years ago, having a conversation like this would have never happened. Why? Homosexuality was still taboo. When I asked my Rav, Rav Ephraim, can I do research like I do on everything else? On incest in the world today? Because when it came to morality, when it came to promiscuity, when it came to tikkun uh, abrit, uh, all that stuff, it's not just the, uh, the biblical research we did and the learning of the Torah and so on. We also did scientific research that we looked into and reviewed and we brought in the movie and so on. So I asked, can I add this topic to the realm of things like we study everything else, like the Holocaust, like, like idolatry and so on? No. I had a lust over the last few days to what? To do research. Not to go look at improper things, to do research. But I was forbidden from doing research. Why? He says, that's Mamash going to the war with the Satan. Even to do research on such a topic. There's enough in the Torah to provide a shield for people. You don't need details and numbers. Why? It's already enough to present it in such a fashion to make you all realize 40 years ago, Homosexuality was taboo. Ora Chaim Kadosh says, the time before Mashiach, we're going to be in the 50th level. In Parashat Achrei Mot, it says that homosexuality is an abomination. So why did you mention a whole list of other things? Because it seems like in this generation, the most disgusting things that are not so much against nature. The most taboo things 
that are not necessarily so far-fetched. It may very well, and hopefully I'm wrong, become the standard. If 40 years ago it was scary for a person to admit what he did in his bedroom, and today they're forcing us to feed children that they cannot decide what gender they are, and no one can decide it for them. And you, they should, the boy should be a girl because he likes Barbies. And the girl should be a boy because she likes pliers. And you should ask your children for permission before you change their diapers, because that's their privacy, and all types of other lefty nonsense. That type of conversation would have never taken place 40 years ago. Needless to say, the topic of incest is very much a reality in the world today. I don't know the exact numbers of how many people are committing this, but I could assure you, whatever the numbers were 40 years ago, multiply them by a factor of a thousand or more. Why? Because look at the conversations people have among themselves and their children. Look at how fathers allow their daughters to walk around. Look at how parents are talking to their children about their boyfriend and their girlfriend. You think that the father that sees his daughter with no arms and no legs, he doesn't think of that? Because she's his daughter, he's so holy. This tameh that allows his daughter to walk around with no pants and no arms and no nothing. She looks like one of the girls that he saw in one of the clubs. She looks like one of his fantasies. You think he's so holy he doesn't think of his daughter that way? You think the mom that's not exactly so happy with the father, but her son that's 18, 20 years old, built like a rock, walking around just with his underwear, doesn't give her some ideas? Disgust you? That's the future for the people that won't be holy. That's the future for the people that won't be holy. Why? That's 50th level. Everything else we've done. Now, if you think this is all new, even that's not new. Incest existed in the Torah since the beginning of time. The son of Esav committed incest with his mother. Menashe had incest. Uh, all type, there was, I'm known, one of the sons of David Amalek committed all types of garbage has existed throughout history. Just like homosexuality has always existed throughout history. Nothing new under the sun. What's the new thing? What's, why is it 50th level? Because although all of it has always existed, it became intolerable when it became the standard. When society turned the taboo into acceptable behavior. Homosexuality was taboo just when I was a kid. I'm not a thousand years old, I promise. I feel like it, but I'm not. Just a few decades ago, it was taboo. Today, it's beyond standard. It's beyond standard. Not just standard, it's beyond standard. Meaning, if you're straight, there's something wrong with you according to society today. How far are we from a generation where a father and a daughter telling the world that they want to get married is no longer a big deal? It's been in articles on the internet you can see. It's happened many times. Father wants to marry his daughter. Mother wants to marry her son, brother and sister. It's, it's, it's all over society throughout its history, recent history. That's not new. The new filth will be when it's no longer a big deal. Just like somebody saying they're homosexual is no longer a big deal. In fact, if he's not homosexual, it's a big deal because he looks like a girl. He spends five hours in front of the mirror just to do his hair to make sure it's straight up. He wears tights and it simply looks like a second pair of skin. He grooms himself more than his wife. You're surprised that he's married to a woman. But here, Rabotai, that's standard. The standard of the future for the people that do not 
choose to become holy will be this. Why? What's to stop them? Why stop? If it's all about you and enjoying you and doing you, you've done everything. You ate everything, you went everywhere, you did everything, you're still unhappy. What's to stop a mom from satisfying her son? Why not? Why not? Give me one logical reason not to. Now you're going to say it's disgusting. To you it's disgusting. You have a little bit of Torah in you. That's why it's disgusting to you. But what if I don't have the Torah in me? What's to stop a person from making the taboo simply preference? Why not? Why not commit murder? Or it's illegal. What if it's not illegal anymore? How many people will start killing their neighbors? How many people will kill their spouses? How many people will kill their own children? If, if, if murder became legal for a day, how many murders do you think would be there? Lots. If you are allowed to rob people for one day, how many robberies do you think would take place? A whole lot. The second homosexuality became no longer taboo. Look how it grew. Once incest is no longer a taboo, Rabotai, because people will come to the realization that a world absent of holiness has no reason not to commit the most heinous crimes known to man. Why? Because it's not even unnatural. Because even the Torah, even a Kadosh Baruch Hu says, it's not unnatural. Homosexuality is unnatural, bestiality is unnatural, yet there are millions of people. One percent of the U.S. population admits to committing bestiality on a regular basis. One percent, you're talking about four million people in America, admit to committing bestiality. If I've disgusted you enough, that's good, that means you're still normal. If you're not disgusted, there's something wrong with you. Four million people just in this country are perfectly happy committing it. They think that Bertha the cow is their girlfriend. Josh the bear is their boyfriend. What's the problem? There's really a bear in a named Josh down the street. He's in a zoo. His name is Josh, what can I tell you? We met him last week. If Josh had a girlfriend, some people would think it's weird, but not those four million people. The second holiness is no longer an admirable thing. The second holiness becomes something that society frowns upon. We turn this world into Sodom and Gomorrah to the tenth power. And that's the 50th level, Rabotai. So you see, it's no longer a easy choice whether to aspire to be holy or not perhaps we had that choice when we were kids to aspire to be holy to not to aspire to be holy to be standard to do your best it seems like the only thing that would save us would be to aspire to be holy why just to maintain our own sanity and to remind ourselves that Josh the bear can no longer, cannot, can never be a husband. Just to remind ourselves that the sister and the brother and the mother are, are not potential shiduch. Even if you see an entire neighborhood of people telling you it is. You have an entire society telling you that the abomination 
is the ideal. Meaning that we are only a rock throw away from them telling you that what's not an abomination is the ideal also. To serve Hashem is no longer something we need to do because we aspire to go to heaven. To serve Hashem has become something we need to do in order to survive as normal people. A society that we have been building is a society of filth that is worse than what you see in a jungle, in a safari. Because even there, they don't commit the heinous crimes that have become standard. Morality has never been so important as it is now. Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai said in the Zohar Kadosh that the generation before Mashiach, their tikkun for the men is going to be learning Torah and tikkun abrit. For women, it's going to be modesty. That's the big deal. Modesty. And sending their husbands, obviously, and their kids to learn Torah. How could this be? Everybody was modest in his day. Everyone was modest during the time of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. You didn't see anybody walking around with mini skirts. You didn't see walking around, anyone walking around with tight jeans. You didn't see any of that stuff. So why could you say the Mashiach will come when everybody's modest? You didn't have uh, the apps that has all the filth and pornography in it uh, in those days. How can you say that when everybody's not wasting seed, that's when the Mashiach is going to come? Simple. The Torah told us, we're going to get to the 50th level of Tumah. That means that all of the things that are obvious, clear to every normal human being in society will no longer be normal. That means that we will live in a society that all of the abominations will become normal. All of the heinous will become normal. All of the disgusting will become normal. And all of the good will be frowned upon. Being mothers today is no longer just to protect you from sins for yourself. It's no longer just to help your friend not get a divorce because her husband is looking at you. It's now also to remind yourself that you have a God, that you're a human being, that you're not a beast in the jungle trying to feed whatever instinct is pushing. Being modest is no longer something that's Oh, maybe learning Torah is no longer something. Ah, when I get time. How are you going to know the difference between an animal and you without learning the Torah? How are you going to know the difference between the goyim that are committing all the heinous crimes that Hashem is saying is standard to them and you, if you're acting the same way? The only thing that will remind us that there is God above us, that there is a future beyond us, that we are a unique people, is our holy Torah. But not just because it's stuck in some closet, rather because it's stuck in our heart and we're practicing it and we're doing it and we're proud of it especially when it distinguishes us from everybody else. The more different we look from everyone out there, the better. The more different we think from everyone out there, the better. The moment you start thinking like everyone out there, you have become them. The moment you find yourself agreeing with the homosexual rabbi, you have become it. The moment you think it's perfectly normal to allow your daughter to walk around with some bikini, you have become part of the problem. And you're only a stone throw away from committing the things that today you believe is disgusting. 
When society tells you it's not disgusting, don't think you won't say, maybe it's not. Learning Torah, doing mitzvot, is no longer just to go to heaven. It's to survive. The downfall of society that we have today, Rabotai. Every guy knows what he thinks about when he was a young man, a bachelor. What do you think? When you have a daughter, other guys don't think like that about her. You protect that daughter like a diamond that's worth a billion dollars. Don't let her walk around like some zona. But how can you convince her not to do it? If you haven't educated her the right way her whole life. How can you convince her not to do it? If her mother does it. How can you convince her not to do it? If you are watching it, if you're acting like it. Every, every father is scared that his daughter is going to, you know, be touched by some paws of somebody. What are you doing about it? If you're letting your daughter walk around like some thing that's out there, you might as well be her pimp. Parents are disappointed when they hear me say things like this. No, why are you saying like that about my daughter? Excuse me, lady. Your daughter, your baby that you think of when you change diapers? She's 18 years old. According to Judaism, she's already been a woman fit to marry for six years. According to the world, she's been a woman since she stopped telling you updates about her period and her virginity. She's no longer a baby. You allowing your house to operate the way it does has enabled her to think that what she's doing is normal. Making herself public property is normal. I'm here to remind you it's not. Now you may think that your husband doesn't see your daughter in an inappropriate way. But that's only because today in society it's still considered taboo. Fast forward a few years, it may not be. Who's to blame? You. How to prepare? Prepare before it happens. I know a lot of this stuff is insane and you're never going to hear this anywhere else. But Rabbi when Rabbi Meir Balanes, when Rabbi Tarfon already spoke about it 2,000 years ago, of how they themselves, as holy as they are, have to be careful of things that are obvious. All they're simply telling us is what HaKadosh Baruch Hu is trying to tell us. If we don't make ourselves holy, we're simply going to fall into the trap of thinking being an animal is good for us. Being an animal is the normal. So Hashem says, you be holy. Why? Because I am holy. When HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, I am holy, He's simply trying to remind us, continue looking like me, not like everybody else. Continue being my people. Don't look like the goyim. Don't act like them. Don't put the hat sideways and think you're 50 cent. Don't start rapping. Oh, there's a new Jewish rapper on MTV if it's still in business. Don't be those people. Be a Jew. Be holy. And HaKadosh Baruch Hu will not only protect you and preserve you, but you won't have all of the troubles and the nightmares that I hear about from endless parents that did not worry about holiness when they had kids. And now they have kids that don't even know what holiness means. And those parents can't do anything about it anymore. Why? It's too late.
He's left the nest. He could do whatever he wants. Even if that means do exactly what his parents don't want him to do. She could do whatever she wants. Even though that means going against her parents. Being holy, Rabbutai, is to save you, is to protect you, but it's also to preserve, to preserve the Jewishness that HaKadosh Baruch Hu created this world for. With that being said, Chavod, whoever wants to ask questions. I think I've discussed it and shocked many of you. You probably have to think of things for a little bit. How about My yeah. son and I have been dealing with, obviously, because we are not alive. Yeah. But one of the things that really bothers us is why is it, even when he was up in the synagogue in um, New York, why is it the Hispanics or the Catholics that, and into the restaurants and in the synagogues, they clean, they're able to wear their crosses in there. Is that still kosher? It's not... A cross, a cross, right. A cross in itself doesn't, it's not forbidden because it doesn't mean anything. It's, it's like a Megin David. Uh, is, it doesn't mean anything holy, even though many people would like for it to be holy. In reality, it has no source in the Torah. Uh, and... Uh, it's something that looks good, you may like it, it's symbolic, it's cultural, but in itself, it doesn't have any holy, holiness in itself. If you take a Magen David and throw it in the garbage, it's not a sin. Uh, I don't necessarily recommend doing it, but again, it's not a sin. It's not like taking a Sefer Torah or something, or taking it filin and destroying it. Where the Shulchan Aruch says, if you see somebody uh, destroying a, a tefillin, or, uh, or Sefer Torah, or uh, Megillah, you have to rip your clothes like somebody died. Uh, so uh, it's a, these are things that are holy, but uh, Magin David is not. In essence, a, a uh, cross is something that's symbolic. Unless that cross is something that they worship, meaning they bow to this cross, which the majority of people do not bow to crosses, especially the ones that they wear. They wear it simply as something symbolic. So it's not forbidden. Uh, and in fact, there are famous rabbis that were gifted crosses and they kept them. One of the uh, most famous stories is that when the prince, I believe, of Spain or the king of Spain gave Rav Ovadia, Rav Ovadia Yosef, Allah Shalom, a cross as a gift. And Rav Ovadia kept it. Rav Ovadia kept it. He didn't hang it on the wall, but he kept it. Why? It was, a, it was a, like a memorabilia type of thing. So a cross in itself is not forbidden according to the Torah. Unless somebody worships it. If somebody doesn't worship it, doesn't pray to it, doesn't bow to it, it's simply like a picture. And it's not forbidden. So therefore, it's never a problem if somebody is wearing it. Now, if you would ask me, uh, you know, would, is it a, uh, uh, would you uh, prefer to have a Jew or a Gentile work for you? If you have a synagogue, you have a yeshiva, surely you would prefer a Jew to work for you. But that's not necessarily always possible. Sometimes the job that, the, that the, you want is not a job that you could find a Jew to do. Uh, you know, there are many jobs in Israel, for example, that Jews simply will not do. So you have many jobs in Eretz Yisrael, in Israel, the land of the Jews, that you will never find a Jew doing. But you'll have all the Arabs doing. You'll have the Arabs doing these jobs because they're the ones that are simply the only ones willing to do them. And uh, there are certain jobs in America that only people uh, that are uh, Spanish or, you know, Latin descent are, uh, are willing to do that the rest of society is not willing to do. It's just the reality. There are certain jobs that just Hindus are willing to do or Chinese people are willing to do. And that's just the reality. So just, their, their, uh, their religious beliefs are inconsequential to us so long as they don't preach them at our premises. But it, the moment you have somebody start preaching their Christianity or Buddhism or Islam in your premises, that's when you have to figure out a way to remove them without getting yourself into a lawsuit. But as far as them wearing their cross or anything like that, it's not really a problem. Again, it's not necessarily ideal, but it's not a problem. So it's a, it doesn't make the, the, the place itself, it doesn't turn the place into a, uh, a church. 
You know, just like you can't say, listen, I declare that this uh, synagogue is now a place of idolatry because the guy just decides to bow to some statue. That doesn't turn the building into a place of idolatry. Why? Because he has to own the place. You can't declare somebody else's property forbidden. Meaning I can't go and let's say in this hotel and uh, decide uh, that, uh, to bow to some statue and say, okay, this is a place of idolatry. No, it's not a place of idolatry. Why? Because I have to own it in order for it to be a place that I determine what it is. So even more so when it comes to things that are like a cross and things like that. So that's not necessarily a problem. Now, sure, again, if a person is looking for Judaism and is very idealistic, especially when someone is a brand new Baal Tshuva or a convert, people are very idealistic and they expect things to be a certain way, a certain fashion, and they're shocked when they enter a synagogue and they see people are talking in the middle of prayer. They're shocked when they see people talking back to the rabbi in an inappropriate way. They're shocked that some women that show up to the Beknesset are not dressing modestly at all. In fact, they're dressing like they're going to a nightclub. They're shocked. This is the reality. This is the reality. And it's holiness is not something that you establish by removing yourself from society. As you see from the Gemara and from everything that I say, no one said, remove yourself from society, find yourself some cave and be there. No one said that. Even Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, he only went to the cave to escape people killing him. He didn't go there to protect himself from immodesty or immorality or idolatry or anything else. The, the point of the Torah is to make yourself holy while dealing with society. Hence the reason, for example, why we would have a lecture at a place like this, even though right behind us is the beach, the prime place of immorality and immodesty and so on, and there's no problem whatsoever in having a lecture here. Why? We're not taking people to the beach. We're simply need a room and we don't have another choice. It's not like we have 87 different choices and we dafka chose to go on the beach in the afternoon. We're at night where typically there's less money. Uh, less immorality and immodesty, at least in, uh, in this vicinity. More, more, more so is that the, the, uh, the immodesty of others doesn't need to affect us. Because holiness is not, a, is not something that's determined by the society around you. Holiness is determined by how you behave. Meaning, the whole world could be immoral, the whole world could be incestual, the whole world can be homosexual and you can still be holy. Why? Protecting your eyes, not looking where it's inappropriate, just because everyone that's walking around you doesn't wear clothes, doesn't mean you have to look at them. Uh, just because there is a uh, beach doesn't mean it's forbidden automatically. There's a lot of things that go into place and people that are very idealistic, they think that if I'm going to serve Hashem, that means I need to be at a place where everybody's religious, everybody's perfect, everybody's Rabbi Shimon Ba Yochai in the making. That's not reality. The overwhelming majority of the world, including Lakewood, Bnei Brak, Yerushalayim, everywhere, the overwhelming majority of the world is going to have immodesty, immorality, problems, heresy, uh, idolatry, and all types of issues. The point of the Torah is to have the tools to know how to deal with it regardless of where you see it. Whether you see it on the beach, or you see it in uh, Bet Knesset, or you see it in the Kotel, or wherever it is, to know how to deal with it. Because yes, you could have a beach, but it doesn't mean you have to go on it. You're going to a facility. You could have a bit Knesset and people are talking. Doesn't mean you need to join them. You could have Im immodest people in the building. Doesn't mean you need to look at them. You could have a lot of things in the world. It doesn't mean you need to be a part of it. The whole point of the Torah is to get yourself enough tools and enough strength, spiritual strength, to have the wherewithal to use those tools in order to live in the Torah. To live in the world, to, to operate in the world. You can't just say, listen, I'm only going to be religious if everybody around you needs to be modest. That will never happen. You will never be part of a society where everyone is modest until Mashiach comes. It will never happen. There will always be somebody that's immodest that will walk around, dafka in front of you. You will never be part of a place where there's no idolatry. It doesn't matter where you go in the world. Yerushalayim, Bnei Park, Lakewood, Mansi, wherever you go, idolatry will be there. Why? This is the world of work. It's not the world uh, that, that you just are here to, to be uh, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. You have to learn how to use the Torah 
in order to protect yourself from being part of all this stuff, in order to be enticed by all of these things. In, in, in so many words, one of the Chachamim says over here, that yeah, there's a, uh, some of the Chachamim were so cur- careful, there was such plushim, they wouldn't even be alone with the animals. When Abaya would learn Torah, he would make sure that all of the animals were, you know, put in, the, uh, in their place and they were not next to him. He wasn't alone with the animals. He was sure also not to have any of his shepherds alone with the animals by themselves. But then one time, one of the other Chachamim was alone with an animal. And he said, wait a minute, aren't, aren't, don't you listen to Shmuel that says don't be alone with an animal? He goes, oh, I didn't even notice it was here. Meaning I was so deep in my Torah, I didn't even realize there was an animal next to me. The point being is, is that it's, it's, society exists. Society exists, idolatry exists, immorality exists. Uh, uh, the, everything I just said is not in order for us to think that there is some form of reality where we can be by ourselves and nothing bad will be around us. The opposite is to use everything we've learned in order to not want to be part of it. Despite it being right next door to us, despite it being right in front of us, of course, do your best not to be in the middle of it, but the point being is, is that don't think that there is such a reality where it's not going to exist. There is no such thing. There are many holy places that have opened where they used to be a church or they opened right next to a church. There are many things that were holy that started at the worst possible places. Why? Because again, when you have the Torah, you have the tools to deal with the world as it is. And not expect the world to change because you changed. You have to you know, work on yourself and make sure you realize that the biggest change is you and the more you change, the more the people around you will change and the more you'll have somewhat of a uh, circle or somewhat of a, uh, 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 a network of, of people that are like-minded. But again, you are still going to have to live in reality. And reality is full of immodesty, reality is full of thieves, reality is full of murderers, reality is full of rapists, reality is full of liars, adulterers, and all types of criminals. That's reality. That's not going away. That's not going away anytime soon until Mashiach comes. Once Mashiach comes, then okay, you won't have to ask for anything else because Mashiach will do the job. But until then, we have to learn how to use the Torah in order to have that utopia already here. That utopia we all want has to exist here. So much so that it won't matter if Sodom and Gomorrah is around you, you won't even notice it. You won't notice it. Simply just, it just simply doesn't exist. How? You have to train yourself to do certain things. So for example, when I said that my rabbi told me, don't do research on this particular topic as far as scientific research, now, I could easily do it, and he would never know. And it's not forbidden according to the Torah. I could do it, but I didn't. Why? Simple. Rabbi said no. No. So it's the end. Is it hard? Sure it is. Why? I want more material. I want more information. I, I, I'm interested, especially now that it's such a big topic, and it's, it makes more sense, and it's legit, and so on and so forth. But that's a boundary that was made for me, and that's it. Not because I'm unique, but simply because of what it is. The rabbi says, I follow. And, and, and that's one of the most difficult things for people to do. People are able to typically make boundaries for themselves to a certain extent, but when somebody gives them a boundary, that's usually when they start revolting. You know, I can make for myself, but if he makes it for me, ah, do I really have to listen to him? Let me see if I can. I have some people tell me, listen, what is, uh, is this allowed? My other rabbi said yes. Wait, why are you asking me if your other rabbi said yes? Why, what is it, like a multiple choice? Who's going to win? Like who's going to give you the answer that you want? And that's unfortunately how some people are. So you have to know that there is a world. We have to exist in it. But we have tools. One of the tools is the Torah. Another tool is to have a rabbi that's going to help you. Utilize that Torah and know how to maneuver in this world. Because that rabbi is going to know certain limitations that you have. He's going to know certain limitations that exist that you may not even be aware of, that have nothing to do with you. It's just a reality. 
that exist that you don't necessarily have the tools to understand. Like some people learn the Zohar and they learn Kabbalah and they learn all types of mystical things. In reality, they don't have the tools to understand and utilize those teachings. Uh, on the other hand, some people run away from learning basic things like the Chumash and, 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 and other things because they think, no, that's, I want something more. You don't realize that you don't have the tools to deal with more. And in fact, even the, the little that you think is little is actually more than you could actually handle. In fact, you're only going to understand part of what the Shiul says. Because you have to build yourself up to those places. So a person needs to have Torah, also a rabbi, and to tell them, go here, don't go here, do this, don't do this. And in so many words, build themselves up under some type of control to be able to assure themselves that any time they get out of control, they make, a, they make a wrong turn, they have at least a couple of things that are going to get them back to the right place. They have the Torah, they have the Rabbi, and in essence, Bezot Hashem, they have the uh, direction back home. But, but most importantly is to know that the idealistic uh, uh, um, uh, utopia that we all wish for has to exist here. And the only way it exists here is if you have Torah in your life. Yes, in the back. How many more signs? Uh, most of the signs that uh, I'm aware of have already happened. Uh, but uh, there is a potential Mashiach in every single generation. Uh, the truth is that the people that knew the most about Mashiach, like for example at the time of the Gemara, they were scared uh, for Mashiach to come for a lot of different reasons and uh, the, uh, I know that people today are looking forward for Mashiach but that's usually because of ignorance uh, most people don't realize that once Mashiach comes it becomes the, uh, the big judgment and whatever a person is that's what they are and uh, the more a person learns the more they realize that whatever they are is typically not enough they have to do a lot more and a person is going to regret that they didn't do more tshuva, they didn't do more mitzvot so quite frankly, the more a person knows, the more they're focused on things that are not necessarily Mashiach. They're focused on themselves. They're focused on fixing themselves, on serving Hashem, on doing more. You didn't see uh, Moshe Rabbeinu look forward for the Mashiach. In fact, Moshe Rabbeinu wanted to stay in this world so he can serve Hashem. Adam Rishon wanted to stay in this world so he could serve Hashem. All of the most righteous people that ever lived wanted to stay in this world so they could serve Hashem. They weren't looking for Mashiach to come. They were looking to serve Hashem. Why? Because the more a person knows about Hashem and knows about Torah, the more they want to serve Hashem. Whereas Mashiach, in essence, is the culmination of this world and, in essence, is the end of a, uh, of a servitude of Hashem. And typically, the more a person does not want to serve Hashem, the more they desire Mashiach. Why? Because they think that Mashiach is going to be a time where they can just take a break and just relax and it's like heaven and their, their debt's going to be paid off and their marriage problems will be fixed and their, their kids are going to be good all of a sudden and everything's going to turn into really good. And in reality, it's not so much that. If a person is, a, uh, uh, is, is not at his best, uh, he uh, should focus on uh, things that are not really relevant to Mashiach. Rather, they fix, uh, should focus on things that are relevant to fixing themselves. Why? Because when Mashiach comes, a lot of the, uh, all of the judgment comes, and a lot of the things that people will be judged for, they don't even realize their, their, their problems. Uh, like, for example, if a person dies, if a person dies, and he didn't have a, uh, he didn't get married, anybody here thinks it's a problem? One person thinks it's a problem. The rest of you don't think it's a problem. Okay, if a person, a person got married, but he didn't have a kid, do you, anybody here thinks it's a problem? No, I'm not talking about problem with, I'm not talking about problem like his personal problem. I'm talking about God has a problem with it. Why? Why would God have a problem with it? He's the one to decide if you have a kid or not. To bring, okay, okay. So let's say, for example, he tried to bring a kid, but he didn't bring a boy. Anybody here think it's a problem? Okay, it's an obligation, but it's a mitzvah ase. It's not a, it's not a mitzvah lot ase. Meaning he's not, he didn't, he didn't forsake Shabbat. He didn't violate Shabbat. He didn't eat non-kosher. He just didn't have a boy. Is that a problem? Logically, the answer is no. Biblically, it is. 
Why? He was supposed to try hard. He was supposed to have more merits. He was supposed to pray for it. He was supposed to do a lot more things in order to do that. Meaning there's a lot of things that people will be judged for that they don't even realize are a problem. So when people say Mashiach now, Mashiach now, Mashiach now, typically it's because they don't understand what that means. Like this whole Chabad movement of Mashiach now is full of ignorance. It has nothing to do with actual real knowledge. You're never going to see a Gdola Do ever say Mashiach now. Never. It's never, it's never, you're never going to find it in any books from the great, greatest tzaddikim in, in, uh, in, uh, 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 of Chabad themselves before the Lubavitcher Rebbe. You're never going to find it from the Baal Shem Tov. You're never going to find it from Abu Vadi. You're never going to find it from uh, Rabbi Akiva Eger. You're never going to find it from uh, Rabbi Wasserman. You're never going to find it from the Chafetz Chaim. You're never going to find it, even in the Gemara, you're never going to find Mashiach now mentality anywhere in the Torah. Never going to find it. Why? Because... What Mashiach means is the culmination of the world, which means that whatever you are, that's it. Now, anyone that thinks that they're ready is not ready. How do we know? David Melech didn't think he was ready. Moshe Rabbeinu didn't think he was ready. Rabbi Eliezer ben Holkinos, the rabbi of Rabbi Akiva, didn't think he was ready. The biggest tzaddikim in the world didn't think they were ready. Somebody came to uh, 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 Rav Steinemann, Allah wa shalom, just died a few years ago. One of the greatest study that lived in the last hundred years and ever. And uh, he was a uh, avrech in a call that had a little bit of money. And he told the Rav Steinemann, listen, for the Rav, I just finished building this house. It was a three years it took, and it was a, it's a beautiful house. We got some money and everything. But now that it's finished, it's such a beautiful house, I'm scared that it's going to take some of my merits in Gan Eden. What does the Rav think? Do you think it's going to take some of my merits in Gan Eden? Rav Steinemann is already 90-something years old. And he looks at it, the guy, he looks at his gabai, one of his helpers. He says, look at this. Here we have a Jew that's already in his 90s. Every moment of the day he thinks about, is it possible for him to avoid Gehenom? And yet here we have this youngster that is sure that he's going to heaven so much so that he's worried about losing a piece of it because of his house. Meaning that the more a person knows, the more he knows his obligation, and the more he knows about the depth of judgment, and the more he's concerned about those things, those obligations, rather than the salvation. Why? Because the salvation is never something that uh, uh, the sages say, oh, when the salvation comes, all of the tzaddikim are going to be saying, yay, Mashiach, go Mashiach now, and start putting tapes and CDs from back in the day about Mashiach. And that's not going to happen. You know what the Chachamim say about Mashiach happen when he comes? All of the tzaddikim will start crying. All of the tzaddikim will start crying. Why? Because Hashem is going to show them the mountain of obstacles they had to overcome in order to survive Mashiach. And all of the Rishayim will also overcome. Because Hashem is going to show them the little hill of obstacles that they didn't want to overcome. And therefore they're going to be destroyed. Meaning no one is going to scream Mashiach now even when Mashiach is now. Why? Because it's not a culmination of, oh great, um, now everything is going to be taken care of, but quite the opposite. It's going to be an achievement for those that are concerned about serving Hashem non-stop to the point where they don't have time to think about, is He going to come, He's not going to come. Why? If I'm thinking about Him coming, not coming, I'm not doing my job. It's not helping me serve Hashem better by determining whether Mashiach is going to come to this war with Russia and, 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 and Ukraine, or it's the next war that we don't even know about yet, or it's the... None of that's going to help you serve Hashem. What's going to help you serve Hashem is doing mitzvot, working on army dot, fixing ourselves, helping people do tshuva, all of those other things. And the more a person is concerned with those things, the less he's concerned about the exact timing of Mashiach. Hence the reason why the Rambam writes, anyone that puts a time on when Mashiach comes, is cursed from heaven. And it's, 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 it's a big thing for the Rambam to say. Cursed from heaven to say that the Mashiach is going to come at a certain time? Yes, cursed from heaven. We see from here that it's cursed from heaven in a couple of ways. Cursed from heaven because he's going against the Torah and putting a timing on something. But cursed from heaven also from the mentality. From the mentality of thinking Mashiach, Mashiach, Mashiach. Look what happened to Chabad. Look what happened to Chabad since the Lubavitcher Rebbe has, 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 has left this world. It's deteriorated to the point where many, much of it has, has turned into almost a different religion. With all due respect to the history of Chabad and all due respect to the good that Chabad still does in this world, if you look at the amount of Talmidei Chachamim that, you know, that actually give this world a reason to exist and you count how many of them come from Chabad today, 
it's almost non-existent. If you see how much wisdom is delivered to the masses by rabbis, by Talmidei Chachamim, and you count among them how many are Chabadniks, it's almost non-existent. If you see how much heresy comes to the world, heresy, things that are against the Torah, God needs you, or, or, or that uh, nobody goes to Genom, everybody goes to heaven, all types of nonsense that comes to the world, and you see Chabad is the dominant force there. They're producing more heresy, more garbage in the world than simply anybody, even more than reform. Because nobody counts the reform as Jews anymore. So it's, it's sad that that happened in the last 30 years. It's sad. Why? Because the history of Chabad is monumental. It's beautiful. It's amazing. If you read some of the stories, you read some of the books, you read the Tanya, you read all of the, the Shulchan al Harab, you read anything that they wrote, that Sadiqim really wrote and actually said in history, it's unbelievable. If you compare that to today's so-called movement, it's simply, it's, it's two different religions. Why? The priority shifted from God to a person. Hence the reason why you see, unfortunately, unfortunately, there is a little bit of, uh, not a little bit, more than a little bit of work being done between a different religion that believes in a guy. And they're working together. There's a movie, a cartoon movie, I just found out today, that uh, was made about Avraham Avinu's life. Uh, and apparently was a joint forces uh, project between Chabad and uh, the church. Chabad and the church made a religious movie. Find me one Pusik that says it's allowed to do such a thing. One Pusik. One Pusik that says it's allowed to do such a thing. So again, if the Lubavitcher Rebbe was still alive, he would never allow such a thing to happen. If the Balatanya was still alive, it would never allow such a thing to happen. No, but so, so that's the thing. So it's, it's important for us to understand. We have to always remember the number one focus, number one focus of our life is to serve a Kadosh Baruch Hu. Not to look for salvation for ourselves, not to look for joy for ourselves, not to, uh, to, to look for any type of pleasure. You have pleasure, you have good, you have panasai, you have to pray for it, but that's not the purpose of your life. Your purpose of your life is not Mashiach. Your purpose of your life is not to, uh, 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 to uh, uh, have the biggest uh, house. The purpose of your life is to serve Hashem to the max. That's the purpose of your life. The moment we transfer that purpose from serving Hashem to serving a person, whether that person is a rabbi or a person is yourself, you have turned from, away from God. You've turned away from Judaism. And that's, that's in essence where a lot of things go wrong. And this is part of the reason why the, the Gaon Mi Vilna was very much against Hasidut altogether because that's what he foresaw. He foresaw that Hasidut is shifting the focus from God to the rabbis. Which he is right to a certain extent. Not about all Hasidut. Surely there's a lot of good Hasidim, good Sadiqim that, uh, that are around the world. But if you look, if, if, if all we had in the world is, let's say, the, the, the Chabad and Breslov movements that are what we hear about the most, then the Gaumi Vilna was 100% right. The world would be better off without them. Jews would be better off without them. On the other hand, if you're talking about 50 years ago, 50 years ago, then no. It's perfectly fine to have them. It's good to have them. It's great to have them. It's wonderful to have them. Why? Because there was still the, the, the same common belief. And that's the thing. That's one of the things when, when you don't have a leader that's going to, that rabbi that's going to lead you back to where you need to be. Right now, there's in essence no leader in Chabad. Everybody's their own. It's a, everybody's a cowboy. Everybody does whatever they want to do. Nobody calls us shots. Everybody has their own, their own shul, their own bankroll, their own $30 million building, their own donors. Sometimes the donors are Christians and, and idol worshippers. Sometimes they're politicians. Sometimes they're against the Torah, whatever. It's, there's no boundaries. As long as it's money and it's green, it's, the, check is, the, the check is cashed. Fine. The reality is, Rabutai, is that without leadership, Judaism simply cannot exist. That's what Rabbi Akiva says. Rabbi Akiva says the rabbis are like the wings on a dove. Judaism is the dove, but the rabbis, the sages, are the wings. Without the wings, the bird dies. 
And that's, 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 that's in essence what's happened. What's happened in the world today is that even the Gdolei Adol, the righteous sages that we have still, many people don't listen to them. Many people don't listen to them. You know, people say, oh yeah, it's too bad that Rav Kanievsky passed away. Did you listen to Rav Kanievsky? Did you read any of his books? Or you just saw his picture on, you know, on some screen once in a while and it makes you feel good? That's the thing. It's like, it's, it's, it's for us to truly uh, know uh, uh, which direction to go in, we have to know what Torah says. And Torah says, don't make the primary focus a person, don't make it the Mashiach, and don't even make it yourself. Make it serving Hashem. The more you focus on serving Hashem, the more happy you will be. The more happy your daughter will be, the more happy your wife will be, the more happy everything, uh, the more happy Hashem is going to be. Why? Because serving Hashem is for your own best interest. It's just that it doesn't come to us naturally. Therefore, Hashem gave us the instructions. Yes? What does the mikveh have to do with being uh, Kadosh? Ah, very good. So Kadosh Baruch Hu has certain rules within the world that He created. One of the things that Kadosh Baruch Hu created is the uh, purity and impurity. Now, purity and impurity is the most difficult subject in Judaism in general. Uh, it's, it's one of the subjects that many people don't even study because it's to the extent of how difficult it is, Tumah Vetara. Uh, but nonetheless, there is a uh, uh, purity and purity doesn't exist only when somebody has a uh, uh, nida, but it also exists in a person. If he touches certain things, if he touches a dead body, if he touches certain uh, 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 dead animals and so on. Now, the world itself also has a certain level of purity and impurity. When the, when the world got to a level of impurity that was so extraordinary, Hashem had to destroy it. He destroyed it with water. Why water? The, the water of the time of Noah flooded the world in order to purify the world from the level of impurity. And it was there for a certain amount of time. 40 is a, is a number that you see in the Torah many times. Because 40 also has a certain uh, uh, biblical connection to uh, purity. So now the, uh, the water of the mikveh is not just some water that they filled from a mountain. This water has to be uh, uh, 40 se'ah. It's a specific quantity of uh, rainwater that has to be put into it in an uh, uh, unassisted way, meaning there has to be a certain tube where the, the, the rain is collected and it goes directly into the place. It's not something that you can just simply you know, take a fountain and just pour it into the, uh, into the mikveh. Why? Because that quantity uh, is in essence one of the spiritual recipes required for, uh, for, the, uh, uh, for Hashem to uh, turn this domem, this water, into something that's chai, into something that's alive. And in order for that, to purify the, uh, uh, the person. Now, there's certain impurity that all of us have and we can't get rid of until Mashiach comes. That's what we'll need the red heifer for. But there is other impurity that we can get rid of or at least lessen. And one of those is the, the impurity of keri. Anytime seed leaves a man's body, there's a certain amount of impurity that's on him. It depends how the seed left his body. Either way, regardless of how seed left his body, that creates a certain amount of impurity similar to, but not to the same level or even near the same level as when a woman has blood come out of her body, when she has her period. That creates a certain amount of impurity. She has to wait until the bleeding stops. Then she waits seven uh, uh, clean days. Then she goes and dips into a mikveh. That's also this 40 se'ah. And then she's allowed to be with her husband until the next time she has her period. Because then she has, she's pure. The, the, the guy uh, used to be obligated to go to the mikveh every time seed left his body, even if he left in the most appropriate way, even when he was with his wife. He, at, at the day after he was with his wife, he has to go to the mikveh before he's allowed to pray and, and, and learn Torah and so on. But uh, Ezra Sofer saw that Am Yisrael was not able to uh, withstand this uh, enactment and they canceled it. So now a guy does not have to go to the mikveh, there's no obligation to go to the mikveh, it's a good thing to do, but it's not an obligation for a guy, hence the reason why there's no, no, uh, it's not, um, no blessing for a guy to go to the mikveh. Uh, if he makes a blessing and go to the mikveh, it's a sin, it's, it's using Hashem's name in vain, but it is something that helps guys uh, in a few ways. One is that it, uh, if seed left his body, 
It created a certain amount of impurity. That impurity is going to make it more difficult for him to understand Torah, to learn Torah, to do good deeds, and so on and so forth. It's, it's, it's in essence, a barrier. So that uh, mikveh will help him uh, uh, remove that, uh, let's say, that boundary that, that's in front of him. Second thing is, even if, let's say, seed did not come out of his body, uh, to uh, the Chachamim say, the Mekubalim say, that uh, any time a guy dips in a mikveh, Whatever keri was supposed to come out of his body naturally, uh, you know, in his dream, not because he's looking at immodest things or because he's uh, uh, touching things not appropriate. Simply, he goes to sleep and it happens. Sometimes that happens because of the body, of how it moves or how it thinks. There's a certain amount of seed that, in essence, is supposed to leave the body at certain times. If he goes to the mikveh, that, uh, uh, that protects him from that happening. Why? Because even if the seed that leaves his body, leaves his body without him doing anything wrong. Meaning, if he looked at things that are inappropriate and seed left his body while he was sleeping, he has a problem. If he did it himself with his own hand, he has a problem. If he did it with a woman, he has a very big problem. If he did it with a non-Jew, he has a very serious problem. If he did it with a married woman, bigger problem, if he did, and so on. So the problem just continues to increase. But even if you start the first, the lowest level, meaning he didn't look at anything inappropriate, he simply, let's say he ate something spicy, or whatever, just been a long time, and uh, he went to sleep, and it happened, it's still problematic. It's nowhere near the same level, but it still creates a certain impurity, a certain klipa, that makes it difficult to learn Torah, to do mitzvot, to accept the truth, and so on. So one of the ways that uh, uh, we have to protect ourselves from that is going to the mikveh. Now, I always remind people of this particular disclosure from personal experience. Remember that modesty is not just a mitzvah for women. Modesty is a mitzvah for men too. Meaning it's a biblical obligation for men too. Meaning, if, you're, if the mikveh that you have locally is an immodest mikveh, it's like the Greeks, where everyone walks around like they're naked, they're just walking around and everything is hanging and they're having conversations, do not go to that mikveh. Or go to that mikveh when there's simply nobody there. Really, really early usually is when people are not there. Why? Because to see other men uh, naked is not allowed. Now, if everybody's covering themselves, fine, no problem. They're covering themselves, they have a towel, no problem. But there are certain places where they treat the mikveh like it's a gym, like it's a locker room in a football, uh, and people just walk around with their stuff hanging out. That's a problem. Don't go to such a place. Now, if you have uh, a, uh, a place that has modesty, and you can go to mikveh once a week, twice a week, every day, whatever you can go, by all means, you should go. But uh, for some people, it's tough to go every day, so they usually do it on uh, Friday morning. Now, there's also levels of how to use the mikveh. There's levels of how to use the mikveh. One of the things that some chachamim do is they dip in the mikveh on Friday morning and they don't take a shower. They don't take a shower. They leave the water on them. For most people, especially in Western society that are very, like, uh, you know, germaphobes, this is completely unacceptable. Why? Because the first thing they want to do after they go to the mikveh is take a shower. Because they're disgusted because other people's stuff is on there and this guy's hair is on it and this guy's beard is on it. And so I mean, eh. Okay, so, you know, do what you got to do. But again, there are levels to the mikveh. There are levels to the mikveh. Either way, if the mikveh is a modest place and you can go, by all means go. But if it's either going to the mikveh or praying on time, go pray on time. If it's going to the mikveh or learning more Torah, learn more Torah. It's, mikveh is something you can do, but it's not a priority. Unfortunately, many times people think that they could, you know, go to the mikveh and still commit all the sins in the world. Like that's going to fix them. It's not going to fix nothing. Mikveh is a tool to help a person on the right path. Not, you know, uh, uh, enable a person to commit more sins. Like if a guy is going to be with a different girl once a week and he thinks he's going to fix that by going to the mikveh, no, he's, he's going to have a different mikveh one day. It's not going to be from water. You know, so it's in, in, in Shemaim, they also have a mikveh. But it's not from water. It's from tzoah, it's from boiling feces and, and things like that. It's not, it's not, it's not a good mikveh. So... You know, if a person knows how to use a mikveh, it's good, but again, to, uh, he needs to know how to use it. Yes? Holy is the problem of the dishes that we discussed. 
Okay. Is there one thing that it all stems from? Is it all stem from? Uh, generally speaking, if you're talking about individual problems, like for example, the, the, the self, a person wants to uh, fix himself, typically it's a, there are two major issues. One is ignorance. Uh, people simply don't know, don't know the truth, don't know uh, uh, the, uh, the magnitude of, of, the, uh, of the consequences. Most people do not know uh, that there's even a uh, 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 consequence for their actions. Like a lot of people, for whatever reason, that are not uh, brought up religious, or they're brought up religious, but with a miseducation, they don't think that Judaism believes in hell. They think that everyone goes to heaven somehow. Not really sure how that makes logical sense, but nonetheless, many people don't think that Judaism believes in, in hell or in Gehenom. They think that everyone goes to heaven because uh, they heard some statement in their Sidu that's in the Mishnah that says, Kol Yisrael ba, that all of Israel has a share of the world to come, and they just didn't read the rest of it. That says, and these are the people that don't. So, a lot of people don't know enough to know what they're doing wrong. That's one. Two, it's, uh, in essence, arrogance. Arrogance that the world has to dance to my tune. God has to dance to my tune. Society has to dance to my tune. People naturally uh, believe that the world is supposed to operate according to what they believe. So, when their boss doesn't uh, do what they want him to do, they figure, let me just replace my job. They never naturally think, maybe I should be a better employee and earn that raise that I desire. Uh, if, if their marriage is not so, going so good, they think, oh, my wife is bad, my husband is bad. They don't necessarily naturally think that they are the problem. And, and as, there's a rule in, in, in humanity which the Gemara in Masechet Shabbat says, en adam A person doesn't see the obligation in himself. So this comes from arrogance, because arrogance is what leads a person to say Lashon Ara about somebody else. Arrogance is what leads a person to uh, think it's okay to commit adultery, or to steal, or to be jealous, because in essence it's a person that thinks that the world was created for them, uh, and then sometimes by them, not very different than Paro. So when you have ignorance and, uh, and arrogance mixed, it's the perfect recipe for a disaster. When a person wants to make themselves into a vessel of, of good, a vessel of holiness, they do the exact opposite, which is learn more, wisdom, and humility. The more humble a person is, the more they become a vessel for Hashem to put more wisdom in them. And the, the more humble they are, the more they know how to use that wisdom. Whereas if a person is arrogant, they don't know how to use that wisdom. Why? Because they'll think that that wisdom makes them better than everybody else. So they'll misuse that wisdom. They'll say, oh, but I know more than you, so therefore I'm better than you. Not true. You may be better than me at A, B, C, but I'm surely I'm better than you at something. And even if you're better than me, I may be more righteous than you. And even if you're better than me, I may be more uh, this than you. So that's, that's one, one of the things we learned from the uh, Igeret Ramban. The Ramban wrote a letter to his son, uh, Rabbi Avraham, and he told him that uh, never think that you're better than anybody else. Always look at other things, that they may be uh, more humble than you, or they suffer more than you, and so on and so forth. So in society today, we live in such a world where the uh, society teaches you that it's all about you serving your pleasures and, uh, and, and satisfying your, your desires to such an extent that the second society doesn't meet uh, your, uh, your agenda, your protocol, surely it means that society is wrong and you are right. Uh, it's this, uh, and this, there's even movements today called Me Too, this Me Too movement. And it's, 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 it's not necessarily uh, directly talking about what we're talking about, but it it's, it's shows you the mindset of society, that everything is about me. Everything is just about, you know, fulfilling my needs. So if we become more humble and also uh, uh, acquire more real wisdom, that's divine wisdom, that's the recipe to solve all of these issues. All of these issues. And that's, that's in essence what Torah wants us to do. Yes? How am I able to... I guess kind of not give, really give them a reality check, because I don't know. 
more light to do that, but <coughs> make them realize, like, oh, I have to, like, do something about, you know, the way I'm living right now. Right. So, uh, as far as one of the things you said is about who, you, who are you to do it, when it comes to achieving things of this world, such as uh, wealth or, 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 or uh, some type of uh, physical aspiration, people typically are not very uh, humble. Typically, people are very ambitious. They, everyone believes that they will succeed one day, they'll be rich one day, they'll marry the girl they want one day, they'll uh, have kids one day, they'll live to 100 million one day. Everybody's very ambitious. And, 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 uh, but when it comes to spirituality, people suddenly become humble. So it's supposed to be the opposite. When it comes to the spiritual uh, ambitions you have, you don't say, who am I to do it? You are the son of God. You are, you have a tzelem elokim inside you. You have a, 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 the image of God is, is, is on you. So you are a big deal. You're a very, very big deal. Which means that if you learn how to use that holy spark that's within you, you can make all of Am Yisrael Tshuva. You can learn the entire Torah. You could be the biggest chacham in the world. You could be gdolado. When it comes to spirituality, if you start learning how to use that spark in you, you can become a very, very big deal. And you already are a big deal if you, if you know how to use it. When it comes to physicality and so on, these are things that Hashem decides anyway. So that's why there's no purpose of being overly ambitious to be rich and so on and so forth. Hashem's going to decide for you anyway. Now, uh, as far as to the, the greatest way to help the world is by first helping ourselves. Meaning, the more we fix ourselves, the more we become a place that people can desire to be like. Why? Because the, in the beginning, when a person start, first starts doing tshuva, especially if they're a little older, 20, 25, 30, typically they have a few amaleks around them that don't want them to do it. Typically they have a few people telling them, ah, you're crazy, who, who brainwashed you, why are you doing this, just live your life, enjoy yourself. There's typically a few people telling you that you should go to nightclubs instead of going to the Beit Knesset. Later on, if that person would stand the test, he or she will get to a point where those very same people that told him to go to nightclubs and told him to continue eating non-kosher, those same people will come and ask him for help, will come and ask him for a blessing. Why? Because he or she that did tshuva will start progressing in a completely different direction, a better direction where they have control over their desires, they have control over their actions, they have control, uh, they have their life under control, they have direction. Whereas those people are losing control more and more. More and more they don't know what they're doing. More and more they don't know why they're keeping. More and more they want to divorce. They want to get married. They want to have kids. They want to kill their kids. They want to get a new job. They want to start a new company. They just went bankrupt. They just borrowed money. They don't know what to do with it. They just lost the money. They gambled. They're very sporadic. The more, more people have, the less people have God, the, the more out of control they are. Hence the reason why you see Hollywood in the nature that it is. Where it's the most abominable people in the world because they have absolutely no God. So now, you have a, uh, a, a world where one person was uh, like uh, Ruth, that went in the direction of God, and one is like Opa, her sister, that went against God. Ruth became the uh, merited to be the grandmother of Mashiach. Opa merited to be the mother of Goliath. Okay? And that's, that's what you have here. She became a woman that was impregnated by a hundred people, she became a woman that, is, that lived to see her great, 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 great grandson. Meaning, she, Ruth lived to see Shlomo Melech on his throne. She even lived even longer than uh, 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 David Melech, which was her great grandson. So, you have here these two people, they're sisters, they lived at the same time, they chose two different directions. Same thing happens in this life, where you choose to do tshuva, you stick to, to Hashem, you're going to go in a certain direction that's very different than the world around you. And eventually the world around you will realize that it's lost, will realize that it's simply chasing its own tail, and is going to need somehow to, like somebody to help them. Who is better than somebody that they know? Such as you. So first thing is to work on yourself, to learn the most you possibly can, to do the most you possibly can, to be a leader by example. To be a leader by example. If you make learning to all your priority, somebody will notice and maybe they'll invite themselves oh can i learn with you but if you learn just when other people want to learn or you learn only when there's a big lecture or you learn only when you have time but it's not a priority in your life 
Why should it be priority in their life? If the Torah is priority in your life, if Hashem is a priority in your life, the world around you will notice it. And at some point, some of those people are also going to want it, and they're going to need somebody to help them get in. Everybody wants somebody at the door. You know, you go to a place, fancy schmancy place, the best thing you can possibly see in that door is somebody you know. Why? Maybe I could skip the line, he can hook me up, I can get in, right? Everybody wants to know somebody at the door. You could be that guy. Why? Because you've been here already. Your friends, your brothers, your sisters, and so on, they're not going to ask you right now. They may ask you down the road. Why? Because you've been in that place for so long, this is, oh, this, that's the direction he's going. So, first thing is to continue improving yourself. Second thing is, uh, be approachable. Meaning, it's important to tell people that they're doing something wrong, but not only telling them that they're doing something wrong. Meaning that, yes, if you see somebody that knows what Shabbat is, light fire on Shabbat, then sure, tell them you're not allowed to light fire on Shabbat. But if that person just discovered he was a Jew yesterday, to tell him he's lighting sh uh, uh, fire on Shabbat, it's not necessarily the, uh, 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 the best thing to start off with. Perhaps tell them who God is first, and then you can go to Shabbat. For those people, by the way, this reminds me, some people uh, 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 don't realize how much Hashem loves this generation. He gives us so many opportunities to, to do tshuva through the things of this world. For many years, the, uh, the heretics liked to debate uh, the, the, the rabbis about saying how uh, the rabbis made, uh, made stuff up, such as that electricity is fire. Electricity is fire. So they said, no, electricity is not fire. Electricity is not fire, so you using your phone, you using electricity in your house, it's not really fire, and, and, and they, the rabbis are making stuff up, they're fanatic, they're so on. Well, HaKadosh Baruch Hu had mercy on his generation, and he has the new lighters, the new standard lighters. I just bought this for $7, I needed it for my barbecue, and I bought the new lighter, and I wanted to get a regular lighter like I've had for the last 40-something years of my life, but the regular lighters are hard to find. They're hard to find. Why? Because this became the new standard. What is this new standard? This is the new lighter. The new lighter is this. This is the new lighter. Electricity. That's the, new, that's the fire. So, can anybody tell me in the world that electricity is not fire anymore? When it now becomes the new lighter? This is, this is the new lighter. This will light uh, a bonfire. This will light a barbecue. This, will light, this is the new standard fire. This little tiny thing. Now, if I put my finger in it, it's going to burn my finger. But this is the new lighter. This is $7. It's not like an expensive lighter, fancy schmancy. Uh, you know. No, this is simple lighter. It's actually cheaper than the other lighters. Why? Because the Kadosh, why did the Kadosh make some scientists think of this? Why did the Kadosh make some scientists think of this? To help us keep Shabbat. And stop with the excuses. People say, no, why, what's me playing with my phone on Shabbat have anything to do with, uh, with uh, fire? I'm not learning fire. I'm just uh, playing with my phone. No, no. Your electricity is fire. Yeah, this is the proof. This is how you light fires today. This is how you light fires today, with electricity. So now nobody has the excuse to say that electricity is not fire. The point being is, the more you know how to apply the things of this world that have something to do with everybody else's life, the more you can make the Torah relevant to them. The more you can make the Torah relevant to them. This is part of the reason why I, Rav Mizrahi, and, and other people, Rav Zamil Cohen, and others that have been doing it for many, many more years, have always taken things from this world that to, to show it to people. It's not really that I'm interested in anything. Like for example, Rav Ephraim, God bless him, every day he has a shiul, a live shiul, where he talks about something that happened in the news. Now, he doesn't watch the news. Two seconds before the shiul, he has uh, some application that gives him a headline, and he makes a shiul about that, and he connects it to a million and a half different sources in the Torah. So I think yesterday or the day before, it was announced that uh, Elon Musk uh, uh, bought Twitter. Okay, now, if you asked a few months ago, a rather frame, who Elon Musk is, he wouldn't even know that he existed. He wouldn't know who Elon Musk is. But yesterday, he made a whole shiur about it. Why? Because it had to do with something in the Torah and so on. The point being is, is that why do that? Because you can take something that people can connect to and help them connect it to what they need to connect to. And everything connects to the Torah. So the more you learn Torah, the more you'll learn how to connect that Torah to, your, to the world that's relevant to your friends and family and so on. Unfortunately, what, what the Yetzirah convinces some people to do 
is he convinces them to learn more about the news in order for them to connect it into the Torah. This is why sometimes you'll hear rabbis, instead of quoting Rashi, or quoting Rambam, or quoting Abiy Akiva, who do they quote? Tony Robbins, or, or, or some other metoav, some other filth that's in the world today. They're not going to quote Rabbi Akiva. They're going to quote, I don't know, uh, some quote by Sun Tzu. They're going to quote Aristotle. They're going to quote Darwin. They're going to quote uh, some philosopher from the, from the nations. As if the Jews don't have wisdom. The last thing, the last thing you should ever do is uh, put the, the, the wisdom of the goyim in the same caliber as the wisdom of the sages. Because it's not, it's not, it's not even true. But the problem is that people think, oh, but I need to know about this world in order to help people. Yes, you need to do it in such a fashion like Aaron HaKohen. Mishnah Navot says, Aaron HaKohen, Oev Shalom, Rodev Shalom, he, he loves peace, he chases peace, and he brings Am Yisrael to the Torah. Not the Torah to Am Yisrael, meaning you bring people to the Torah. So what do you do? You learn a lot of Torah, and then you use the Torah in order to connect it to something in their world. Not learn about their world and then connect it to the Torah. It's not the opposite. And unfortunately, that's what happens. A lot of times people think that if I'm a hip rabbi, if I'm a cool guy, and I know a lot about the news, I know a lot about technology, I know a lot about all this, you know, the, the, the ten plagues of this world, then I'll be able to uh, be hip and cool and connect to the world. No. All you'll do is become one of them. So the key is to learn a lot of Torah, and Hashem is going to give you the siyat of Ishmael to connect it to everything in the world. To everything in the world because it, everything is in it. Afokhba ve'afokhba de kulaba. The Mishnah Navot says, delve into it and delve into it because everything is in it. There are seven wisdoms in the world, seven wisdoms that are created in the world, all of them are in the Torah. All of them. Whereas if you look in the wisdom of the nations, they have some wisdom, but they don't have all seven. They have a little bit here, a little bit here, a little bit here. In the Torah, all seven wisdoms you'll find. So if you have that with, you have more Torah, you'll have more tools to help the people around you. And again, it's a, it's a, uh, it's the biggest thing of all is siyat dishmaya, divine assistance. Having the divine assistance that Hashem will help you help people is something that requires merit. Meaning, not everybody can do kiruv, but rather everybody that has merit to do it. Meaning Hashem has to want you to do it. You have to have a ticket. He says, oh, that ticket? Yeah, we'll accept that ticket. You know, some people, they have a ticket. They go to an uh, event and say, well, sorry, we can't accept your ticket. Why not? I paid $1,000 for this ticket. Sure, you paid $1,000 for this ticket, but it's not to this event. It's the wrong event. So sometimes a person has a ticket, but it's the wrong ticket. So you want to have the right ticket. The more mitzvot you do, the more Torah you learn, the more desire you have to help people, the more your ticket will become effective to help more people. Yes, what are the questions? Go ahead. Upside down. Okay. And, um, and one, as a, as a, as a you know, young person, might be scared to start a family, or grow a family because of what their children might want. Right. Um, should we still aspire to have a big family? Sure. Why not? Or should we be content with having just a boy and a girl? More, more children, more blessing in your life. There's no reason whatsoever that society being disgusting should discourage a person from building a, a family. I mean, quite frankly, the more disgusting society is, the more a person should be encouraged to build a family, so at least you'll have somebody to talk to. If you, uh, if you only have a, uh, if you only have a, uh, you know, a, a one son, one daughter, uh, you have to realize that one day those, uh, those son and daughters are going to get married and move away and have their own life and you'll have nobody to talk to. Uh, so the, 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 the more you build a family, the more you'll have more people that are like-minded, the more you'll have, uh, you're adding more good to the world. Uh, whereas if, uh, if a person is, uh, uh, you know, doesn't, you know, doesn't uh, think that the world is uh, good, that's good that he doesn't think the world is good, but it's a, uh, uh, it doesn't mean that he should uh, uh, run away from it. He should add good to the world. Add good to the world. Yes, uh, Moshe. He's excited for Mashiach to come, yeah. Yeah, I mean, personally. Um, can I ask, can I, can I say, can I mention, can I say his name? It won't make a difference, but yeah, go ahead. His name is Rabbi Aron Anaba. Okay, tell it. So I was wondering if, if uh, he speaks a lot about Mashiach, he speaks a lot about um, 
Uh, yeah, I mean, there's nothing wrong with Rabbi Alon Rava saying that he's excited to be Mashiach, uh, for Mashiach to come. If, I, if, if anybody has done as much for Am Yisrael as Rabbi Alon Rava or Rabbi Mizrahi or anybody that has really done uh, Kiruv in, in a real way uh, for an extended period of time, uh, you know, then they, uh, they should be excited for Mashiach to come in a sense that they'll have a lot of reward once the Mashiach comes because if they continue to be uh, uh, righteous and they continue to do mitzvot, then all of the people that have done tshuva due to them and have done good due to them uh, will, will give them their, their reward. Uh, but the average person has not done even a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of what we have done uh, as, uh, as, as Kiruv rabbis that have helped people. The average person has barely even done Shema Yisrael the right way. The average person has barely helped their friend to the bathroom. The average person barely says thank you to his own parents that brought him to the world. The average person has not done so much good in the world. So that's why I say the average person has to focus more on helping themselves. If a person is a, a, a Rav Kanievsky uh, that has uh, toiled and toiled over the Torah, and you would ask him, do you want Mashiach to come? He'll tell you, yes, for him personally, sure. But if you think about the klal, if you think about the nation, you think about everything else, then you realize if Mashiach were to come right now, we are in deep trouble because the vast majority of people will simply not survive. Uh, so for an individual, sure, uh, that person that's really righteous could be. But if a person thinks of things in, uh, on, uh, on, a, on a larger scale, then no, no. Uh, it's not. It's not a. Uh, it's not a uh, something that a person would look in, look uh, forward to because you realize people that you know, people that you care about, or even people that you don't know and you don't care about, but they're Hashem's children. They're going to be rotting in Gehenom because they didn't have uh, the opportunity to do tshuva. Uh, that's not exactly exciting. So uh, again, if a person has done everything they possibly can to do the will of Hashem themselves, which includes helping a lot of people do tshuva, then surely they will uh, be very, very happy when the Mashiach comes. If a person uh, is still in the process of doing tshuva themselves, maybe help themselves, maybe help them another person, that person should uh, work uh, on, uh, on himself and not necessarily focus on Mashiach. Uh, it's, it's a... Uh, uh, I think it's, 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 there's nothing wrong with what he says if you have the right perspective. If, if, he's, if he's talking to himself, he's right. If he's talking to, uh, if, if, but if a person understands that as they should be excited be, while they're violating Shabbat, while they're uh, intermarried, while they're uh, you know, uh, uh, committing all types of immorality crimes, no, they should cry. They should pray to Hashem not to bring Mashiach. Tell you the truth, most people should pray for Mashiach not to come. If they understood what the judgment is going to be when Mashiach comes, they'll pray for Mashiach not to come. But that's not going to help them. You know why? Because even if Mashiach doesn't come, they could simply die tomorrow. And the judgment is... is, is, is <laughs> so that's the thing. People always think about Mashiach as being the end. I don't even understand why. Death happens a lot more frequently than Mashiach coming. It happens every single day. Millions of people die every single year, somewhere around 60 million people die every single year. But yet nobody thinks, oh, what happens to them? People always think about Mashiach as if everybody's gonna survive to see Mashiach. Like, death is, is your own personal Mashiach. That could happen a minute from now, an hour from now, a year from now, 10 years from now, 120 years from now. And that's, in essence, that's the judgment. So that's, that's what people, people don't understand. And that's, actually, the Chafetz Chaim says something beautiful. And one of the Sfarim, that my dear son, uh, Ovadia, told me to take with me, uh, and he brings this Chafetz Chaim. Little Ovadia brings this Chafetz Chaim. And he says, he says that every person that, uh, that uh, attends a funeral or pays a Shiva visit understands clearly that ultimately a person dies. Nevertheless, this awareness does not have much of an effect on people. And sometimes it has no effect at all. Meaning, you just realize somebody died your friend, your cousin, somebody you know down the street, some big person died, you even went to the funeral. Most people, it has very little effect on them. Some people, no effect at all. Literally, they could stand right next to the body, won't make a difference. They could be one of the people burying the body. Doesn't affect them at all. Why? Why? Somebody told me just the other day, Rabbi, I need your help. Why? Something's abnormal with me. So what's wrong with you? He says, uh, my, uh, my, my father died and I don't feel anything. 
Tell me why. I sent, I sent him this. Why? Why this? He says, the reason why, the reason why Chafetz Chaim, the reason why that person in his, in, uh, doesn't care is because in that person's mind, so-and-so died. But it has nothing to do with him personally. And that's why the Mishnah says, consider three things and you shall not come to the grip of sin. Know where you came, know where you're going, and before who, you will give justification and reckoning. Meaning that one has to constantly picture in his mind what will ultimately happen to him. He is the one that is headed for a place of maggots and worms. He is the one who will be held accountable before the king of all worlds. And he is the one who's going to have to deal with the fact that Hashem does not show any favoritism and does not accept any bribes. Meaning, the reason why death does not affect us is because we don't think it's going to happen to us. Cancer that you heard about, your cousin, your uncle, just got it, he's got the fourth stage. Five minutes later, you're eating your lunch. How come? You don't think it's going to happen to you. No one thinks they're going to die. No one thinks they're going to get sick. And Be'ezat Hashem, no one does. But the reality is, people do. So what does the Chafetz Chaim says? You want to do tshuva? Start thinking about everything that's happening in your life. That's because the Kadosh Baruch Hu is telling you, that was supposed to happen to you. That's why I showed it to you. It was supposed to happen to you. Earthquake in India. 30,000 people just died. Am Yisrael has to do tshuva. Because 30,000 Hindus, idol worshippers died in India. I don't, Am Yisrael has to do tshuva. Why? Hashem says, I sent it to India, but in reality it was happened to, to you. That sacrifice you brought to the Bet Mikdash, you slaughtered that cow, the cow died. Poor cow had a husband, had a few kids, wanted to send him to school, wanted to raise him in a, in a good home, but you killed it. Why? Because you made a sin. You made a sin, so you killed the sacrifice. Why? HaKadosh Baruch says that cow that died was supposed to be you. The cow that died, you just shakht it, supposed to be you. The earthquake, supposed to be you. The guy you just buried, supposed to be you. The woman who got sick, supposed to be you. Meaning, HaKadosh Baruch is not sending it to you just to show you what's in the neighborhood, what's on the news. Everything that's around us is supposed to happen to us. And the way for us to thank HaKadosh Baruch is say, HaKadosh Baruch thank you. Thank you for not making it happen to me. From now on, I'm going to be better. I'm going to be better before it does happen to me. He got cancer fourth stage, and I have to do tshuva. Why? Because in reality, it was supposed to happen to me. In reality, it was supposed to happen to me. If I could Baruch Hu, check my checkbook right now of, of sins and mitzvot, it was supposed to happen to me. Why? Just wasted seed, just did, just committed adultery, just did uh, this, just did that, just stole this, just violated this. If I could Baruch Hu did the accounting right now, fourth stage was supposed to happen to me. Death was supposed to happen to me. Losing an arm was supposed to happen to me. Losing money was supposed to happen to me. Everything was supposed to happen to me. That's why Kadosh Baruch Hu it to me. That's what Rabbi Chaim Yivalozhin says. Anytime somebody has suffering in their life, that's a Kadosh Baruch Hu telling you, that's where you sinned. Your arm hurts, that's because your arm was used inappropriately. Your eyes hurt, your eyes were used inappropriately. Your pocket hurts, that's because your money was used inappropriately. Or else there would be no, no point to the punishments. But even more so, it happens in the things around us that we see. HaKadosh Baruch Hu is telling us, that was supposed to happen to you, but I'm showing it to you to help you. So it doesn't happen to you. But many times people look around the world, just like the Chafetz Chaim says, they see a dead person right next to them. Nothing changes. Why? It didn't happen to me. He thinks he's lucky because it didn't happen to him. He doesn't realize the message is for him. So that's the beauty. The beauty is to use the messages that are around us and realize this is another warning from Hashem for me to do tshuva. For me to do tshuva. Not for, oh yeah, he violated Shabbat, that's why Hashem killed him. Okay, fine. Let's say you're right. He violated Shabbat, that's why Hashem killed him. But why did you have to see it? Why did you have to be the one that discovers the body? Why did you have to be the one that buried him? Why did you be have the one that suffered from him because it's somebody related to you? Why? Because also you, also you. It's not just, uh, Hashem doesn't have a limited accounting. So that's the thing. A person has to start realizing that anytime they're nonchalant about the world around them, that means they're disconnected from Hashem. They're disconnected from Hashem. 
They have to understand that all of the things that are around you have something to do with your actions. So the beauty is, is that if you start taking accounting of your actions versus what you're supposed to do, what Hashem is showing you versus what uh, you'd like for Him to show you. Is that Hashem? It helps insp inspire a person to do better. Yes? The Hindus didn't choose to die for the Jews. The Japanese didn't choose to die for the Jews. But the world was created for the Torah. And the nation that chose to serve Hashem by, by fulfilling the Torah is the Jewish people. Now, so the, uh, the, therefore, the world exists due, due to the merit of the Jews learning Torah. But that does not mean that the, the Goim don't have merit. There are Goim that the, they're, they're included in the definition of Israel, and I'll give you guys a chidush of a lifetime. Chidush of a lifetime. Every Jew and many non-Jews knows the famous statement: "Kol Israel yesh laim chelik leolam haba." Right? All of Israel have a share of the world to come. Ve'amir kulam tzadikim. Right? Comes Rabbi Vadya, Kadosh Rabbi Vadya, in his sefer on Pirkei Avot. His sefer on Pirkei Avot. He says, a chidush of a lifetime. He says, what does kol Israel mean? What does kol Israel mean? All of Israel. So why did not just say Israel? Why did not you say Israel has a share of the world to come? Why does that say kol Israel? All of Israel. He says, because we learn, we learn from the Chachamim. Anytime there's an additional world, additional letter, it means to magnify it. For example, it says, kabed et avicha ve'et imecha. Uh, honor your father and your mother. Was the ve'et imecha also honor your older brother? Okay, uh, the the, the uh, to to honor uh, to, to fear Hashem. It also has the et says fear Hashem and it, and the sages and the rabbis because they're his messengers. They're they're telling you what Hashem is saying. So now, what does call Israel means? Comes Rav Ovadia says call Israel means I'm Israel and also who's call? Call is the righteous Noahides. In call Israel. Call all is the righteous Noahides. The righteous Noahides are considered part of Am Israel in a sense of the, this description. How do we know? Because the rest of this Mishnah, Rabbi Vadya says, what is the rest of the Mishnah says? Call Israel, Shlem, Chedek, Olam, all of Israel have a share of the world to come. And these are the following that do not have a share of the world to come. And it gives you the, the names of all the wicked people that don't have a share of the world to come. And some of them are Goim. So he says from here, the Rambam tells us, from here we learn that they don't have a share of the world to come because they're wicked, but had they been righteous, they would have a share of the world to come. But needless to say, they're in the same statement, which means they're included in this description. Where they're included? In the Kol Israel. Israel, we know who Israel is. Kol Israel. So Rabbi Vaya says, he brings several different proofs of how this, is, uh, this, uh, this uh, description is uh, meant not just for Am Yisrael, but also for the righteous Gentiles. For the righteous Gentiles, meaning Gentiles that are not just good people according to them, but people that are following the Torah because HaKadosh Baruch Hu said so. And following the Torah according to their laws, not according to the laws that people make because they want to you know, generate donations from people. You know, there's some people that are creating a new religion, they're calling it Noahides. Noahides is in the Torah, but some people are creating Noahides, but as a religion. As if they're telling, listen, we're going to make you a prayer book, and you can observe Shabbat, and you can keep Sukkot and all the holidays. This is not true. This is not true. You're, you're creating a new religion. Yes, being a Noahide is at times more difficult than, uh, than, uh, uh, than you would imagine. But nonetheless, you can't create a new religion. Either way, there is a place for everyone that's righteous in the Torah. There is a place. We just need to learn where to find it. So... When it comes to the wicked people, the wicked people that are worshipping idols, that Hashem kills them, they're dying because of their sins. But Hashem is showing it to us in order to tell us that we are also making sins. We are also making sins and therefore we should do tshuva or else the same thing would happen to us. Now as far as the people that are righteous Noahides or righteous Jews, the more righteous a person is, the more that person will be willing to die for the rest of the righteous people of Am Yisrael, for the rest of the people of Am Yisrael, because they know that that's part of, 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 uh, of, of their mission in the world at some times. So, again, it's a, uh, 
it's, it's not that any of these uh, Gentiles that Hashem kills uh, uh, is uh, their choice. He's killing them because of their actions. Their actions. And, uh, but we utilize whatever is happening in the world in order to see where our actions measure up. Yes? What do you mean? Uh, it's, uh, I don't know if you ever heard of it. It's called the uh, home, home warranty. It's like an insurance type of business. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Home warranty. Um, I know that the, a lot of the things that they uh, give insurance for, like uh, when they give you warranties, you buy a warranty on uh, you know, uh, uh, appliances, warranties on computers, uh, warranties on your air conditioner and things like that. This is the, uh, uh, you know, one of the uh, havens of the criminals, white collar crime, because number one, they know that uh, most people do not use their warranty. Uh, they either forget that they have it, or there's a million and a half different clauses that makes it uh, never, uh, uh, never be able something that you could actually use. Uh, a guy bought, uh, you know, a five thousand dollar. Uh, unit of something, you sold them a $500 warranty, telling them, listen, you only, you know, uh, you, you're spending only 10% to insure a $5,000 item, it's worth it for you, or else you're going to have to spend $5,000. It's the easiest sell in the world. If he could, you'd sell him two of them. And uh, the guy buys it, and then uh, six months later, the thing breaks, and he says, oh, Steve, listen, uh, the thing broke, but thank God you convinced me to, uh, to uh, you know, to buy it, okay, to, to buy the insurance. Okay, great. What do I do? Oh, yeah, you call that number, because you have no problem to giving them somebody else's uh, phone number. You give him the phone number, he calls the insurance company. Sometimes the insurance was never bought or because the company that sold it is like just complete criminals, they don't even buy the insurance, or sometimes they bought the insurance, which in reality that insurance usually costs about $50, not $500. That's why the, the spiffs are so high, that's why the commissions are so high. But either way, he calls them, he tells them, hey, listen, my unit broke. Oh, how did it break? Well, it broke. Well, how did it break? Well, I pushed the knob. Oh, you pushed the knob. Clause number 13A, side B, says, when you push the knob, we don't have to pay. Bye. But thank you for shopping. Click. When you sell a product like that, even if you have the permission from the government, even if you have the permission from your local rabbi, in Shemaim, you do not have a permission. Why? It's immoral, it's not right, it's a bad product. And you would not want to buy it. So the first thing that you should know is rule of thumb. If you wouldn't be a customer, don't sell it. That's the rule number one. Two, if the commissions are really high, usually that's a problem. Why? Nobody likes to pay high commissions for good products. Good products sell themselves. If the commission's very high, there's usually something wrong. Three, if you see a specific group of people focus and all of a sudden there's new businesses selling the same product popping up like, like, uh, like mushrooms everywhere. All of a sudden everybody's in the cash advance business. All of a sudden everybody's in the insurance business insuring uh, washing machines. All of a sudden everybody's selling uh, you know, uh, this. Everyone's selling this. Why? There's a scam. The scam. Uh, Baruch Hashem, I've been, I've, been, I've been alive for a long time. Baruch Hashem, I've seen a lot of scams. Back in the day when I was probably your age, there used to be what's called a Nokia scam. Nokia scam all the electronic stores. They had this thing that would sell phones and they would, uh, Nokia would give the sellers points for selling phones. But they found a scam that in essence you collect the point by just dialing these phone numbers. And what would happen, you collect these points, these, make these fake, uh, fake uh, uh, names, and they would send you product. They'd send you free cameras, free cars, free stuff, just for these fake things. And people made a fortune out of it. Or they sold refurbished stuff. They sold it, they took the stuff that they bought as, refurb uh, as refurbished, they rehashed it, taking off all the stickers, making it new, selling it as a new product. And a lot of other scams, a lot of scams out there. Don't be involved in scams. Why? Because even if you have the permission of the government to do it, which typically doesn't exist. Eventually, the Dean of Shemaim will come upon a person and those people are guaranteed to lose all of their money. Guaranteed to lose all the money. You see, if you look at the history of all of those people that had these finagling type of things, eventually they ended up losing everything. 
If you, uh, you want to read about it, look up on the internet, Crazy Eddie. Crazy Eddie is one of the original scammers from the Jewish community from the 1970s, 1980s. He started with the electronic stores. I met his, uh, his, his partner when I was still on Wall Street. He's the guy that ratted them out. Uh, he was his partner and uh, he ended up going to jail and so on. Unfortunately, Crazy Eddie made a big chilul Hashem. Uh, and uh, Crazy Eddie started a lot of these scams. But he went the highest possible level. Unfortunately, a lot of other people followed suit. And to this day, they use his tricks to make, to make all types of scams to beat the system. Don't be part of that system. Why? Eventually, HaKadosh Baruch Hu shows you who's boss. You see some people go to jail. Some people die early. Some people see their kids die. Some people uh, uh, get uh, uh, all types of lawsuits, uh, lose their money, gambling, all types of issues. Straight, honest, legit. You end up being the biggest, uh, the biggest success. That's the thing. All of the people, I, I'm telling you right now, I've said this already in the last couple of years since I've talked about it, there's a lot of people that have gone into the cash advance business and people are making a fortune out of it, millions and millions of dollars out of it. I guarantee you that within a matter of years, every single one of those people is not only going to lose all of their money, many of them are going to lose their lives, many of them are going to lose their freedom, they're going to go to jail. It's going to be a major massacre of disaster in that industry. You'll see one after another, every one of them going, why? Because eventually Kadosh Baruch is going to close the shop. What? It's happened before. It's happened before. It happened in England 900 years ago. It happened in Germany 70 years ago. It happened many times. And usually those people that are in those corrupt businesses that are taking advantage of some type of industry loophole, either there's no compliance in the industry, there's no regulation in the industry, there's no watchdog in the industry, there's just a lot of stupid people in the industry and all types of things. Usually a Kadosh Baruch Hu says, oh, they may not be watching, but I'm watching. He's watching him. When he watches, he has patience. He's patient. Like Haman. Haman was the richest person in the world before he became zero. Don't be one. Don't be one of those. Straight, you'll get to a lot of success. And you'll see that some of the people that have been the most successful in history weren't criminals like those people. They did business hard way, but the honest way. And they got far. They got far. And that's, that's, that's the best way to go. Yeah, another one. Ken, a, lot, a lot of cash events. Ken. A lot of cash events. A lot of my friends are in it. And I, I try explaining to them how bad it really is to be in that business. But every, every single one that's doing it says, My rabbi gave me the head to He says, It's okay to lend if it's to a non Jew. And that's the excuse they give me and my friends every time. And I don't get where a rabbi, like, like, I guess a respectable rabbi, would get, would get this, uh, that doesn't make sense. The Gemara in Masechet Sanhedrin, also Masechet Shabbat, talks about Korach. And as Korach, Korach was a Navi at some point. Tzaddik at one point, before Akadosh Baruch put him in Gainom to this day, Korach. But Korach didn't go to Gainom by himself. He took 250 of the biggest rabbis in the world with him. Because they went with Korach. So Gemara asks, how did Korach convince the biggest rabbis in the world, aside from Moshe Rabbeinu, Aaron HaKohen, Yeshua ben Nun, Kalev ben Yefune, and Bezalel, and uh, Nachshon ben Aminadav? Literally, there's a handful of tzaddikim left in the world, and the other 250 biggest rabbis in the world are going to gain on with Korach. How did he convince all these people? Come on, ask this question. How? Korach was rich, and he gave big donations. You know what happens when you give big donations? All of a sudden you become the Mara Da'atra. All of a sudden you're Da'at Torah. All of a sudden your opinion is what matters. Your opinion, yeah, yeah, the Moshe Rabbeinu said what you said. Oh yeah, you know what, what'd you say? What the check say? Million dollars? Yeah, yeah, you're right, you're right. Your wife does not have to be modest anymore. It's not, it's, she's like everybody else. She doesn't have to cover her hair. She's like everybody else. It's okay. No, modesty is not relevant to your wife because you're rich. I mean, no, not because you're rich, because, because it's, that's how everybody else is. Now all of a sudden the rich guy, Bala, bala, you know, bala me'az, bala, bala de'az. In Hebrew they say, the one that owns the hundred is the one that owns the opinion. So that's what happened. It's in the Torah already. It's in the Gemara. So what happens? These rabbis, these, these, these toys, these atzitzim, that are telling people they can do cash advance. All of these reshaim, these rabbis. What are they doing? Simple. They're setting up their bank accounts. They're telling them, listen, what business are you in? Cash advance. Who you donate to? 
Oh, no one? Okay, let me come, come, I'll paskin for you. Come, I'll paskin for you and I'll show you where to donate the maaser. So you have bracha. You have bracha in your business? You have bracha. You want bracha, right? And you're all, you want also a lachic permission that you're allowed to do what you're doing. This is where you donate to. Make, you know what? Forget, forget check. Let's do wire. wire you know what? Let's do direct deposit. Direct deposit, they become a partner in the business. They become a partner in the business. They own 10, 20% of the business. How do they own 10 percent The maaser. The Maser, he owns 10% of the business. Chomesh, you want to be a tzaddik? He owns 20% of the business without working. For what? For giving him the permission to be a thief. The permission to be a thief. No posek in the world, real posek in the world will allow people to be in the cash advance business, not because they're lending to goim, but because of what they charge. What they charge makes their business illegal according to the Torah. Anybody. Surely they're not allowed to lend the money to Jews. But they do. Because no application is allowed to ask somebody, Hey, uh, Steve, are you Jewish? You can't ask. You don't know who you're lending to. You don't know who you're lending to. You could be lending to a Jew. You could be lending even to a Frum Jew. And then you, you lost your Olam Abba with that one lend. You lend to a thousand people. One guy is a Jew, you have no Olam Abba. One guy is a Jew. You led to 10,000 people. 10,000 people you have. You're, you're a big uh, tzaddik in, in the business. Everybody wants to borrow money from you. Right? One guy is a Jew. One guy. You led to 10,000 people. One guy is a Jew. You go to Gainom forever. Only a moron and a rasha merusha will permit such a business. Doesn't exist. Then I said, no, no, if he's a Jew, we sign a teriska. How do you know he's a Jew? Maybe he doesn't go to your shul. Maybe he's not uh, this. Maybe he's not that. It's a lot of problems. And even more so, even if he's not a Jew, who gave you the permission to charge 40 points, 40%, 50%, 80% interest? What prosec in the world allowed you to charge such uh, predatory rates? What's a predatory rate? A rate that you know people cannot pay. Unless their business skyrockets. Meaning, unless your customer ends up succeeding beyond his own ambitions, he will default on a loan at some point or another. Why? Who can pay 40% interest? Go, go borrow $10,000 with 40% interest. See what happens. You go bankrupt. So, so nobody could allow it. The Torah itself does not allow such a thing. So now, if a person says, no, no, I lend money. I try to focus on goyim, a general public and so on. We depend on a majority and so on. And I charge normal rates. What's normal rates? I charge 15 points, 15%, like the banks, 8%, whatever it is. Okay, you have permission to do it. But nobody allows the people to charge 50, 70, 80, 100, 200, 400% that they charge. And that's what they charge. I didn't make this stuff up. I talk to people in the industry. I talk to people in the industry. They hate me, a lot of them. That uh, whoever, leaves the, whoever likes me, leaves the industry. Whoever doesn't like me, whoever, uh, whoever uh, stays in the industry, ends up hating me. Why? Because I remind them that what they're doing, everybody knows it's not allowed. Nobody thinks it's a kosher business. Nobody. Even the people doing it know it's not a kosher business. Why? How? Would you borrow money from those people? Would you pay 50%, 60%, 80% interest unless you were desperate? You're not allowed to, and you're also not even allowed to, to, to lend money to such a person. There's so many halachic problems with that business that that's why you're never going to find a gdola do that will ever write anything good about it or write any psak on it. Not one. All the letters that they have is from some local rabbi that nobody knows, but he likes money. Some guy that likes money. Nobody knows these rabbis. Nobody knows. Go ask. Go ask the gdola do. Go ask the rishon de tzion. What, you think the, the, uh, the community in Brooklyn doesn't have connections to the rishon de tzion? Some of the people in that community can get them on the phone. If they really want, they, want, they can get them on a plane to America tomorrow. How come they don't get a psak from him? How come they don't get a psak from him? For the other stuff, they get a psak. How come they don't get a psak for this? Why don't they get a, uh, a psak from the uh, Arab Shalom? Why don't they get a psak from uh, all of the Dolim in America? Why don't they get from one of them? Nothing. They don't get anything. They get from, from some local rabbi that likes money, that wants to buy a second house. And he's going to kosher their business. Why? Because the rabbi has the same desires as them. They both want money and they want to find a so-called kosher way to be thieves. And eventually they're all going to lose. And this is something that I've brought in, I think, maybe four, five, six shiurim I did about that industry. 
I brought many sources from the Torah, from the Poskim, from the uh, Rishonim, uh, that show that it's 100% forbidden to be a part of their business in any stretch, in any way, to be an owner, to be a broker, to be anything, anything connected to that business. And I also brought historical events that happened to the Jewish people when they were in this type of business. It's not the first time. Am Yisrael unfortunately has a history of being in the lending business in such a fashion that we're known as predatory lenders throughout all of history. It's not a new thing. So much so that Shlomo HaMelech, Shlomo HaMelech 3,000 years ago forbid lending. Shlomo HaMelech made a takana, he's not allowed to, not, not to do it. Shlomo HaMelech already dealt with this problem. 900 years ago we had a massacre in England because of our lending. One of the reasons why the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the Nazis, Imach Shimam Vizicham, justified murdering and massacring us and so on is because of lending practices we had. Part of which were made up, they, they obviously imagined in their wicked minds, part of it was true. Part of the stuff that they, they, they blamed us to do was true. We did charge high rates, we did do certain things that were wrong. We can't, can't just say, oh no, it's all fake. It's not all fake, there are certain things that are historical validations. And the reality is, every single time we were in a position of power, it's because there were a few Jews that were lending money to the Goyim, and many times it happened that they charged them high rates, and the Goyim got angry, and they revolted. Why? Nobody wants to pay the high interest. So what do they do? Instead of paying the interest, they kill you. Simple. It's very easy for a Goyim to kill. So all of these people that are building this industry, I've said it in my shurim in the past, and I'll say it again. All of the Jewish people, and you could put this on YouTube, because it's already on there anyway. You could send it to all the rabbis and send them, it's for me, with my face. Every single person that's putting up, that's writing people a permission to be in the cash advance business, merchants cash advance, all these stupid businesses, all the fake stuff that they're doing. Every single one of those rabbis will go to Gainom and will never come out. Why? They are part of creating the next Holocaust that's coming to America. They are creating the next Holocaust that's coming to America. Why? History shows us what we've done, what transpired. What we've done, what transpired, what we're doing, and what's transpiring. Cash advance business rise, anti-Semitism rise. You see how the world is operating. The corruption is rising. With all of the billions of dollars that are in the cash advance business, all of the rabbis that are involved in the cash advance business, all of the religious Jews in the cash advance business, how come you don't have one respectable gdolado, one respectable posek to give a psak on the industry? Say, this is allowed, this is not allowed, this rate is allowed, this rate is not allowed. You have it on every other business that Jews are in, you have major poskim overseeing certain things. How come you don't have it on this business? How come they're taking kids, bachurim, out of yeshivot, out of kolels, and putting them in this garbage business? All of a sudden, the guy that can barely speak five words of English becomes the number one salesman in a cash advance business. How could that be? How does anybody think that this is normal? These are unfortunately people that are chasing money and they're destroying the people. They're destroying society. They're going to destroying small businesses. The average co consumer defaults on a loan, is forced to take another loan, and is in essence in a never-ending uh, battle against paying interest, and that's why it's called a predatory loan. It's a loan that kills its owner, kills the, the, the person that borrows the money, slowly but surely. What you ends up happening is that the, the, you're selling a product that in its nature, in its nature, it's there to kill the consumer. So, to, to, for, for Am Yisrael to have anything to do with that is obviously a chilul Hashem, at the least. Obviously against the Torah. And anyone that wants to say otherwise, give me a posek. Give me one real posek. One gadol with billions of dollars in the business. We're not talking about, it's not a rinky dink uh, laundry mat. It's not a laundromat. It's not a little kolel with a million dollar budget. It's a multi-billion dollar business. There are some companies that have gone public to five, six, seven billion dollar market values. Talking about billions of dollars in this business. People are making $100,000, $200,000 a month after six months in the business. Talking about big money in this business. You can't get one posek, one real posek to give you? 
Go, I'll, gi- I'll give you the phone number. I'll give you a phone number to some of the greatest poskim in a generation. They won't even talk to these people. They said the ganavim, the thieves. Thieves. I have connections to the uh, head posek in, in, in the uh, Av Bedin in Yerushalayim business. Av Bedin in the, uh, in the Bedin of Yerushalayim when it comes to the uh, issues of business. Arav Gidon ben Moshe. When we mention this to him, he says, but it's only goyim, right? Meaning, not goyim, the customers. Goyim selling it. No, 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 no. Jews are selling it. He goes, how's it going? He says, you can't do things like that. He goes, who does? Not only a few people. I said, no, no, a lot. He started crying. Listen, the, ca- the people I speak to about this business, they started crying about this. They can't believe that we've gone down so bad. So bad. And when I tell them rabbis have certified this, they say, ah, they reform. Reform. No real posek will give you a permission to do this business. It's, it's simply a predatory business. Eventually, a Kadosh Baruch Hu will show everybody who's boss. And everybody that uh, ignored the truth, they're not only going to lose their everything that they've made, they'll lose the future too. Because it's going to be very, very hard to do tshuva. Very hard to do tshuva from such a thing. In so many words, you're, you're, you're practically considering like you're murder, murdering every customer. Just, just think of it this way. A Jew is there to better the world. Not to take advantage of the world. To better the world. How is anybody bettering the world by giving them a loan that they know statistically they cannot pay? And you tell them, no, but statistically we have this. Habibi, I was in the business for 20 years. I know more about finance than any rabbi on planet Earth. Not because I'm a rabbi. I was on Wall Street for 20 years. That's my, that's my expertise. Don't tell me who can pay and who cannot pay. It doesn't exist. Statistically, the business is a flawed business. It's a flawed business. You know how we know one of the main things logic will tell you it's a flawed business? If it wasn't flawed, this business would become standard everywhere. Now they're going to tell you, yeah, but Goldman Sachs is getting into it and a few hedge funds are getting into it. Yeah, but they dip into a lot of different things. They dip in, they dip out, they dip in, they dip out. They didn't make their primary business into this garbage. Nobody is, because everybody knows the bubble's going to pop at some point. Just like people dip into speculative real estate, speculative Bitcoin, speculative this, speculative that. The more money you have, the more you have to speculate a little bit. But no real entity is getting into this business. Why? Because it's a corrupt business and eventually it's going to go down to nothing. And all of the people that have given an hechsher on it are going to lose in a big way. And I'm not even talking about losing this world. They're going to lose Olam Abba. Because they're leading countless people astray and they're leading the worst people to lead astray. They're leading the religious people astray. That's what makes them the biggest murderers. If you went and misled a bunch of goyim, some people in China, some people in Hodu, some people in, I don't know, Afghanistan, to go do this business, that's one thing. You're taking kids out of yeshiva, you're taking kids out of a kolel, and you're telling them that after a couple of months you're going to make $20,000 a month, and you're not even educating them enough to tell them that they're stealing. By the time they realize they're stealing, they're already too far in. No, hard it is to leave that business. I had a few guys, Baruch Hashem, I got them out of that business, more than a few guys. But some of these guys left the business crying. They said, listen, Rabbi, I was 20 years old, I was making 50000 a month. Where am I going to make that kind of money? I told him, you're not going to make that money. Tell you the truth, you're not going to make that money. You're not going to make half that money. Why? You're 20 years old with zero experience about anything. You have no right to make $50,000 a month. You're making $50,000 a month, you should have already known by that there's something wrong with it. You have zero experience, the only thing you know how to do is talk. You didn't even know what you were selling. You didn't even know about half the stuff that I knew about the product and I'm, and I was not even in the business. So, a lot of people, they're, they're, they're going into it, mamash, themselves as victims. Themselves, they're victims. But you can't cry victim forever. Once you start collecting checks and cashing checks of 50000 a month, you can't cry victim. Can't cry victim anymore. So, all of those guys, all of those girls, all of those rabbis that are in that lending business, the predatory lending, they're charging 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 100, 200% interest rates. They have themselves a problem with a Kadosh Baruch Hu. And uh, it's a problem that is going to be very, very hard to solve. Very, very hard to solve, if not impossible. 
And if they want to say otherwise, don't waste my time with your text messages and insults that they've been sending me for the last few years since I exposed this business. There's no need for that. It doesn't affect me anyway. I have skin like a lion. It doesn't make a difference to me. The Send me a psak alakha from a respectable posik. Not your local uh, rabbi that only his wife heard about him. A real posik. Go to a gdolado. Go to, if you don't have one, I'll give you one. Get a real psak alakha from a real posik after giving him the details. I'll give you whatever you want. I'll erase all of my lectures and I'll start promoting your business. Not one of them will ever do it. You know why? It's not possible. Same thing I said to the guys in the wig business. Show me one real psak alakha, one real posik that can tell you that all of the real hair wigs are kosher, really kosher. Like there's actually somebody that follows them like you're supposed to follow, like you follow meat. Nobody can write a real psak alakha that's allowed. Nobody can tell you that's really allowed. Nobody can tell you 100% they know it's not coming from idolatry. I can tell you it's coming from idolatry because I have evidence I have research, I have videos, I have, I, have, I, have, I have witnesses that still live there in India now. That's the thing. When you're dealing with, with, with one of these people that you know, grew up in a community that told him he's a nobody, and uh, he became some avrech and eventually they made the local rabbi, they could play with that guy and they could tell him whatever they want. I didn't grow up in a local. I, I grew up in the streets. I grew up in school. I grew up educating myself. I grew up getting an MBA. I grew up on Wall Street. I was on Wall Street for 20 years. Baruch Hashem, I grew up doing a lot of different things. You can't, can't play with me. I come with proofs. I come with evidence. Every shiur, I come with proofs. Why? Because on Wall Street, we had this policy. If you don't have evidence for what you say, you're not allowed to talk. Don't tell me this company is worth such a thing. I don't care what you think. I need evidence that it's worth such and such. I need evidence. I need information. I need you to know, tell me what's the CEO's phone number. I need you to tell me what he does for a living. I need you to do what he does for fun. I need you to tell me how many kids he has. I need you to tell me what the company does on the books that's not being shown on the books. I need you to tell me everything and anything that the public knows and doesn't know before you tell me what you think it's worth. So if you're, not gonna, if you're gonna tell me with your opinion, take your opinion and send it to the bathroom. When I come to my shulim, I come with evidence. I come with information, I come with sources. When I brought the sources against the wig business or against the, uh, the, uh, the cash advance business and all the heretics out there, I come with sources. Why? Because that is how you deal with things. And they've already had the information for years. Their best defense, cursing me out. That's the best defense they have. They send me text messages and they curse me out. Oh, you know, blah, 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 blah. And some of this from rabbis. Blah, 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 blah. Well, you know, uh, like a, you know, like a frog. Back, back, back. Okay. Give me psak alakha. Real chacham that's going to tell me this is allowed. Nobody's going to tell you it's allowed. Nobody. All the boys that hear this, all the girls that hear this, you want to do yourself a big chesed? Run away tomorrow. Don't even cash the next last check. Because you're going to have to pay all of that money in blood. Every penny you made from that business, you're going to have to pay back. Don't even cash the last check. Let them keep it. Let them keep it. Yes? Rabbi, um, you mentioned in one of your shiurs, I believe it was the last one, that uh, certain congregation or certain group of people were supposedly suing you. You were in the middle of a lawsuit. Ken, Ken. <laughs> messianic, messianic Christians. They call themselves Messianic Jews. This organization called One for Israel, Imach Shimam B'Zicham. They are the spiritual Nazis of the world. I, uh, I've spoken against them already for several years, and uh, they're suing me for libel. Uh, we've defended the lawsuit. We have a lawyer, and uh, we're defending the lawsuit. We've sent them our response. Uh, Bezat Hashem, the lawsuit most likely will get thrown out. And if it doesn't get thrown out, then simply we're going to win and make it into a big Kiddush Hashem that uh, not only did we end up winning the lawsuit, but we also made fun of idolatry in the process. I'm not concerned about the uh, lawsuit, I just don't like wasting my time dealing with these idiots. But as far as the lawsuit, yeah, I'm being sued by Christians, and I don't uh, doubt that uh, more of this will happen uh, in the future uh, as, as the wars continue. Uh, but uh, one thing I can tell you for sure is that one of the things that the church has done is the church has become 
uh, a lot more aggressive in their missionizing. And uh, one of the reasons why very few uh, organizations and rabbis deal with them is because of lawsuits. Because anytime uh, anybody speaks against them, they use all types of intimidation, whether it be lawsuits or threats of lawsuits or all types of uh, physical threats and so on. So a lot of rabbis simply want to be left alone, leave me alone, uh, you know, you go do you, I'll do, you know, I'll deal with my people. And uh, they, they end up uh, running away from these people. But uh, Baruch Hashem, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, you know, they, they, uh, you know, they came to play with, uh, with, with, uh, with us and Baruch Hashem, we're not, we're not new to fights, we're not new to lawsuits. We're not new to wars. That's my whole life is war. Since the day I was born, I was full of wars. And Baruch Hashem, that's why Kadosh Baruch Hu brought me to the world to do, to fight wars. And Baruch Hashem, I'm fighting the war of Hashem. Uh, so I don't like it. In fact, I hate it. But this is my role in the world. So uh, these people are just another war. And it's important for us to fight this war. Because if we would submit to their stupidity, uh, then in essence what they would do is they would uh, have a lot more ammunition to do even more of this to other people. So, but if uh, uh, our fight, in essence, is not for uh, protecting any loss that we would have, because even if they could prove their case right, there's still nothing for them to win, because the, uh, the, uh, the case doesn't have validity in itself. There's no actual financial loss. Uh, but either way, the, the point of why we're fighting it is because this is for the, a war of, of, for the sake of Hashem. It has nothing to do with, uh, with money. They're looking for money, obviously. They're looking for recognition. They're looking for a lot of things. But for us, it's, it has nothing to do with money. Uh, that's also why it also uh, was difficult for us to find a lawyer. Uh, because unfortunately, most uh, uh, lawyers care about money first and money second. And at some point, the, the client comes in. Uh, and, uh, you know, so a lot of people will tell you they can handle a case... But in reality, they don't have the skill set. They don't have the know-how, they don't have the skill set, uh, but they, they have the, the ability to tell you that they'll charge you 50000 100000 200000 for something they don't even know how to do. Why? Because they can learn it with you paying for the bill. It's like you're paying the lawyer to go to college. So, you know, I've dealt with lawyers a lot. I've spent already half a million dollars on lawyers over my life. Uh, so I've dealt with them. I hate them, every single one of them. Uh, and, but I have to deal with them. They're, they're, they're part of the world. Uh, either way, it's a, uh, we have a lawyer, we have a response, we have a case, and Bezot Hashem will sanctify Kadosh Baruch Hu's name in that way too. Anything else? Yes? Uh, is uh, all the bad, in quotes, that Hashem does good, like let's say if Chas Vashon, someone's, someone's mother passing away, uh -huh. like is, is all that he does, is it, is it for the good, like well, what, what's Hashem to be on all the bad, all the bad things that happen. Ah. Uh, okay, so the Gemara in the Gemara in Masechet Shabbat, page 105b, says that when a person uh, sees a, another person dying, uh, he, um, he died, he has to rip his clothes. He has to rip his clothes, uh, rip his garment as a sign of mourning. Now the Shuchan Aruch in Ilchot um, Kriya, Ilchot Kriya says, where, where is the, really the source of this? In Siman Shin Mem Seif Lamed Zayn. So it says, Aroe Sefer Torah Shen Israf or Tfilin. או אפילו מגילה אחת מנביאים או הכתובים, קורא השתי קריאות ודווקא ששורפים אותה בזרוע, כמעשה שהיה. This is one of the things I brought you in a shiur. So it's not that I have such great memory, it's just I brought this in a shiur. So now, the Torah says, the Shulchan Aruch says that if somebody sees somebody burning a Sefer Torah, destroying a Sefer Torah, or tefillin, or something like that, he has to rip his clothes. Just like the Gemara says, when you see somebody die, it's a, you have to rip your clothes. And the Gemara says, why? Because it says that uh, just like somebody, uh, a Jew that dies, is like as if uh, a uh, Sefer Torah that was uh, uh, destroyed. So, the Sheila is, how come the two are being compared? What does it have to do that a Jew died and a uh, Sefer Torah is uh, destroyed? 
So some mefarshim will say, the Jew died, so he can't do any more mitzvot. So it's like he can't do any more mitzvot, so it's like a sefer Torah is destroyed. Okay, it's a nice answer, but it's not really giving us uh, all the taste that we want, all the things that we want, because, okay, you can tell us he's not doing any mitzvot, but that's in essence, you know, you know it's mitzvot that he was going to do. How is that sefer Torah, Mamash? So, the uh, Rabbi Shlomo Kluger, Allah Shalom, in his responsa, Turtam Vedat, his responsa is Tshuvot Ana Shuchan Aruch, in uh, the sixth volume, same, uh, you know, Siman 340, Allaha number five, C5. Uh, he says, why? Why is the Sefer Torah being compared to a person? And it says that when you, it's not just any Sefer Torah or Tefillin that gets burned, but rather if it gets burned intentionally. It gets burned intentionally, Bezroah. So it says that if the Sefer Torah gets burned intentionally or something like that, then, then you rip your clothes. And that's being compared to a person dying. So Rabbi Shlomo Kluger says, how come it's the two are being compared? He says because when a person dies, there's no such thing as a man dying for no reason. He died because he made sins. Nobody dies for no reason. So therefore, his sins led to his death and that is considered as if he he himself burned the Sefer Torah. So you are ripping your clothes for seeing him dying, not because it's a, uh, he died, but rather because it's like a Sefer Torah, because he in essence burned the Sefer Torah. The point of what I'm trying to say is that there is no such thing as somebody dying for no reason. There are four people in history that died without sinning, that's in the Gemara. But uh, Kehat, one of the sons of Shlomo, uh, Amram, uh, uh, Benjamin, uh, and I uh, think uh, Ishai, uh, the uh, four tzaddikim that uh, died without sinning. But other than that, everybody, everybody sins. Everybody sins. So Kadosh Baruch Hu says, that sin sometimes will cause a person to die today, sometimes will cause them to die six months from now, sometimes will cause them to die 20 years from now, and so on and so forth. So... Anyone that dies has to understand, anyone that, that, that has somebody that, that, that dies has to understand that that person didn't die because of the car accident. He didn't die because the doctor gave him the wrong prescription. He didn't die because of corona. He died because of a sin. Hashem simply used these tools, the car accident, the coronavirus, the, uh, the whatever issue uh, out there, as a way to kill him. But either way, it was already judged on Rosh Hashanah for that person to die. Now. Is that good? Surely it's the best option available. Meaning, it's not good for us to say, oh, it's good that he died, we're so happy, yay. No, it's not necessarily that. But out of the options that that person had, it is the best option. Why? If that person was a rasha, we pray for him to die every day. Or to do tshuva. Why? Because the more... He goes against the Shem, the more he's eventually going to suffer in Genom as a result of his sins. So it's better for him to die so he suffers less. Now you're going to say, yeah, but pray for him to do tshuva. We do. We pray for him to do tshuva or die, whichever happened first. Because every sin that he makes is more suffering. And we don't know if he's going to make tshuva. So surely we know that if he at least dies right now, it's, he's going to make less sins. He's not going to make any more sins. So that we know for sure. But if he does tshuva, that's preferable. Either way, we say it in our Amidah three times a day, every Jew. Says in Amida, Alminim Valamazinim Valamazidim Loti Tikva. There's a section in the uh, uh, Amida that we pray for people that are uh, uh, missionaries. We pray for people that are wicked people that do it intentional. And so, in essence, if the person is wicked and he dies, uh, we don't uh, even mourn him. We don't even mourn a person. It's a Shuchan uh, Aruch. Also, same Siman that I just talked about, Siman 340. Uh, Talks about a person that's a wicked person, you don't mourn him. You don't rip your clothes. If you use Mechalat Shabbat, you don't rip your, your clothes. In fact, uh, Shukhan Aruch says when a person that's a Mechalat Shabbat, a uh, kofel, someone that goes against the Torah, dies, put on white clothes and have a party. That's the Alcha. You, you don't mourn wicked people. So if he's a wicked person, surely it's the best thing for him to die. Because at least he's not going against God even more. At least he's not desecrating Hashem's name even more. At least he's going to get, at least. 
the punishment will end up to this pun after this uh, uh, level of uh, of sin. If he's a righteous person, then we could cry for our loss that we don't have another righteous person next to us. But we don't need to cry for him because if he's really righteous, he's going to heaven. It's better for him to go to heaven than be in this rotten world. So we cry that Rav Kanievsky or Rav Avadia or Rav Kaduri or, or the Staipel or all the tzaddikim died. Not because of them. They're going to heaven. We cry for us that we don't have the merit to live among them. So surely it's for the good. Meaning, if he's righteous, surely it's better for him to be in with Hashem and Gan Eden than for him to be in this rotten world where there's a lot of tests and trials and tribulations. If he's wicked, surely it's better for him to die than, than make any more sins. Now what about the people that are left behind? Depends. Depends how they take it. Depends how they take it. Now, Hashem does the cheshbon before he kills anybody. He does the accounting of who deserves it. Meaning that when somebody dies or any damage happens to anybody in the family, Hashem doesn't only do the accounting for that particular person and what they deserve, but also who else is going to be affected by it. Meaning, if this person is, deserves to die, but he has a righteous son, he has a righteous daughter, he has a righteous neighbor, he has a righteous best friend that doesn't deserve to suffer, him dying, that could give that person more life. So that's, that's why I say that you have to, if your person wants a long life, to, to try to help as many people as possible to the point where they all become dependent on him. Why? Because their merit will give him more life. Their merit will become more life. But it's, a, uh, it's important for a person to know that everything that Hashem does, it's not necessarily the best choice out of all choices. It's the best out of the choices that are available. You know, you could say, listen, this person can either make $1,000 or he could make $100. And you can say, no, 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 give him a billion dollars. No, no, it's not one of the options. Giving him a billion dollars is not one of the options. A thousand or a hundred. Those are the options that are available. A billion is not available. Or you could say, lose a hundred or lose a thousand. No, 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 don't lose anything. No, that's losing, not losing anything is not an option. It's either a hundred or it's a thousand. That's the options that you have available. Why? Because the actions that he made, the sins or the mitzvot that he made, dictated an outcome either a loss or a profit or whatever it is and that is all that are the options that are available and Hashem always chooses the best option out of the options that are available the best option yes I'm not trying to get into the, into the subject of Mashiach but <laughs> no, no, it's okay unless you can ask about Mashiach I don't care it doesn't affect me I'm, I'm simply telling you guys what it, what it says I'm not telling you that not to talk about Mashiach I just don't uh, uh, you know if you have questions I, I don't mind it's, it's, it's fine. So, as you said, uh, as well, it says in the Torah, there's a, there's a, a potential Mashiach in every generation. Okay. So, that, that means, uh, so if there's a potential Mashiach in, in every generation, then that Mashiach, he has to be protected. Like, the Mashiach, that's, the potential Mashiach has to be protected throughout his whole life. By who? By, by Hashem, in theory, you know, because if he has free choice and if he has free will and the whole life, no, Hashem doesn't doesn't uh, doesn't uh, mess with people's free choice. Whoever the Mashiach is, he doesn't know he's Mashiach until Hashem chooses him to be the Mashiach. Uh, and that person surely has to fit the description. He has to, to fit not just the description of lineage; he has to fit the description as far as actions and so on. He has to be a righteous person and so on and so forth. So uh, that is something that he has to fit a description based on his actions not based on him uh, uh, being uh, molded into it Hashem doesn't make him into like a little putty oh this is the Mashiach this generation this is the Mashiach next generation people have to fit a description based on their own actions uh, so if they follow the will of Hashem and they also fit the genealogy and it's also the time and so on and so forth all of those uh, uh, numbers on the uh, uh, you know on the lock fit then you could open the lock and you know uh, you know, just like you have a, the the, uh, the locks that have the numbers on them. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, yeah. Numbers, numbers on the locks, and you have to put. You'll say it's four digits, and let's say it's five 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 six. Okay, so if you put six 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 five, it won't work. It won't open. You have to put five 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 six, right? So the Mashiach has to fit each each thing, each category has to fit what it's supposed to be. Uh, the, uh, and once it does, and it's the, one of the main things is that it has to be a specific timing that Hashem chooses. Hashem will bring the Mashiach. Hashem will bring the Mashiach. It's, listen, the topic of Mashiach is, is extraordinary. It's discussed by the sages. 
Uh, but uh, nowhere uh, do you really see any of the great sages make it into a uh, like a priority as like uh, this is what we live for or like this is the main body of his work. None of the great sages made Mashiach the, their, their main uh, body of work. Like you're not going to see uh, uh, Rav Ovadia or the Stipler or the Chafetz Chaim or, or any of them write a book just about Mashiach. It's just, it's, it's not... It's not that it's not interesting. It's interesting. It's important. It has, but it's not the foundation of Judaism. The foundation of Judaism is serving God, and that's what people, unfortunately, have uh, 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 you know, have made a mistake in. They've tr they've unfortunately followed the mistake of the Christians, where they've made a uh, a person into the uh, uh, into the religion uh, in some aspect. Uh, this is what's happening with certain uh, parts of Judaism. They've made their Rebbe that died 30 years ago into their religion. Like you see, you see many, many of the talks, many of the, uh, the, uh, the things that they say, they talk about the Rebbe, don't talk about God. Sometimes you'll never hear God, Hashem, nothing, once in an entire lecture. You hear the Rebbe a million times, but you're not going to hear God. So that's a problem. That's a problem. So and you, many times you see people that focus on Mashiach, Forget about Al Chot Shabbat. <laughs> They'll know everything about Mashiach. They know that Gog and Magog and two thirds of the world is going to die, and that the world is eight minutes. It's going to be a war, and it's going to be this and this. This thing is going to happen. And the king is going to come from here, and the Shevet Reuven will come from the out, out behind the mountains, and there's going to be all types of supernatural things, and the ten plagues will be there, but it's going to be in a different format. And they know all the things they think about, but they don't know Al Chot Shabbat. They don't want to keep Shabbat. So. He could be the biggest expert in the world on Mashiach. He still go to Genom forever because he doesn't even keep Shabbat the right way. Or he could be in a uh, promiscuous relationship. Or he could be wasting seed. So that's the thing. Mashiach does not help anybody do tshuva. It's not, the topic is interesting, but that's where a person needs to leave it. As it's interesting. Learn about it once, twice, finished. Move on to many other topics. Go on to other things. And Bezat Hashem, we will all Go on to other things. I appreciate everybody coming out here, especially the ones that have uh, flown out here, that have drove a long place. Uh, I'm going to now, uh, you know, sit a little bit. Anyone that has uh, any private questions, any personal issues wants to come, or wants to get a blessing, uh, please uh, come. We, um, we have the place till about 2 o'clock in the morning, so we have a little time left. Um, but Bezot uh, Hashem, we'll continue to... Uh, one second. I think, here we go. Papers, can't throw them at the Torah. Um, the, uh, we'll continue, Bezat Hashem, continue to grow, we'll continue to learn, we'll continue to serve HaKadosh Baruch Hu and HaKadosh Baruch Hu only. Uh, and Bezat Hashem, listen, I think different than the second part of the lecture. The questions and answers are always uh, more of the uh, practical day-to-day -day stuff that's on people's minds. Uh, so the, the first part is usually the shocker that uh, gets people uh, uh, to think a little bit. That's what we need. We need to think a little bit in order for us to serve Hashem even more. And also at the same time, we need to also deal with the day-to-day -day issues. I'm going to do the raffle now. Uh, I think I'm supposed to be picking two tickets. Two tickets. And Sat uh, Hashem. Now, seven at Huh? Okay. Hold on, I didn't pick it. Okay, so the first one, zero, 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 one, three, three. Anybody? Zero, 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 one, three, three? Nothing yet? No, you already, you got one? Your ticket is in here, the other one is in here. No, I didn't, I didn't. Oh, you didn't put it in. Okay, fine. Okay. What, not, what you guys took two tickets each? No, one each, but we, we, uh, we got the number. You got it? Okay, so I is first winner. Hazaku Baruch. Your name? Yaakov. Yaakov, Yaakov, Hazaku Baruch, and she'll give you the uh, thing. You get, okay. Okay, that's the first one. You know? All right. 
The next one is 000139. How about if. Uh, eh. There you go, scheme it's for the bot. There you go, there you go. There you go. She'll, she'll give it to you. No, you don't have to give it to her. She'll give it to, uh, to, uh, yeah, right there. Huh? You want me to give that one? To her, to her. Yeah, no, it's fine. She knows. It's fine, fine. Okay, Baruch Hashem. Baruch Hashem. School me the bot. I'll be right over here. Uh, anybody has questions, issues, uh, blessings? Baruch Hashem. Now, save us there. School me the bot.